Hi, welcome to the May 14th, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and make sure everything is coming through as expected. Bear with me just for a moment. Hi, welcome to. Okay, so everything sounds fine on my monitoring stream. My name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. Um, if you and I uh, work as a product specialist for Yamaha Corporation of America based in the United States, uh, I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, if you have not attended a Club Cubase live stream before, how it works is you could submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Or you could uh, simply enter questions in the in the live chat field. We'll try to go through all the questions chronologically uh, as they've been asked. The ability to for people to ask questions will far exceed uh, the time frame for me to answer them in a real time manner. So we'll try to go through them one by one. So if you don't see your question, get an immediate response. If we could try to refrain or try not to post the same question repeatedly over and over again. It just kind of slows down the whole process. We'll try to get through all of them. Occasionally my chat field may get behind and I may lose a couple of questions. And if that happens, I'll apologize in advance. Um, so, but we'll try to get through as many questions. And when you ask questions, sometimes if you could specify which version of Cubase and which operating system you're running. So you could say I'm running Cubase Elements on Windows 7 you know, Cubase Elements 10, or I'm running, you know, Cubase 11 Pro on Mac OS Big Sur. That information uh, is sometimes uh, helpful for me, uh, so we don't have to try to figure out as much stuff. Um, so we have people that are watching the live stream uh, as it's going on, and people that will be watching it afterwards. So if you're watching it live, if you want to just uh, introduce yourself, tell us who you are and where you're from, and we'll get started in a couple minutes as people get logged in. Uh, we will have an index of all the topics covered in the live stream posted in the comments field later tonight. Um, so I'll go through the Hangout again, and uh, we'll type up a summary of all the topics with timestamps so you can go directly to those points. If you want to search for uh, topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to Jan from Stockholm. Is kind enough. He created a website called cubaseindex.com, so you could search there. We also have Agent K, who's always been kind enough to moderate uh, when needed. And another wonderful resource of information that I should point out is uh, the Cubase Nation Discord. And I think Jazz Dude's involved with that with some other people, but that's another wonderful resource of information in addition to like, you know, the Steinberg YouTube channels. Um, so let's go ahead and take a quick look who's on while we get some people logged in and we will get started in just a couple minutes. All right, so I see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo and Jazz Dude, Sir Robert from Atlanta, you know, Christian D68, all right, so we have Stefan from Sweden. We have Agent K, Uno, Mom Uno Momento from Finland. All right, all right. So we have John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Sable Winters from Bay Area in San Francisco. We have Trance Twenty Twenty Twenty. I'm always afraid I'm going to leave one twenty out or say one twenty too many times reading the name from Berkshire, UK. All right, so we have Carlos from Colombia. Welcome back. Great to see you. We have Sir N68 Soren from Sweden as well. We have Michael Pierce from outside of London. Taylor Sapp from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. We have uh, Detlef from Dusseldorf, Germany. Okay. All right, so we have Filter Freak uh, from Sunny UK. It's made his 17th live stream in a row. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started here in just a moment. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We'll have some more people joining us. Um, and like many people during the pandemic, my family is at home. So you may hear my wife working directly above me. Uh, as she does her conference calls and my son, uh, he'll be coming back from school in a couple hours. I may get interrupted around uh, 4.30-ish my time, so about maybe about three and a half hours. So I'll apologize in advance for those interruptions. But let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay, reading through different people saying hello. <clears throat> okay, so we have a question from Taylor. Uh, in the audio connections window, what is group F slash FX for? Uh, Cubase 11, Windows 10. So when we go to your audio connections window, uh, what we actually see is, you know, you have your inputs, outputs, but if you commonly use, you know, like this is your go-to reverb, or you know that you're gonna have a drum bus, you're gonna have maybe a vocal bus, a guitar bus, you could have these kind of defined already. So if you wanted to just add a group channel, so you could say, okay, I wanna add a group channel for, uh, drums. So I'll come here. Let's just add our group channel for drums. And now if I know that generally I want to use uh, a reverb effect and for that reverb, I wanted it to be, um, let's just say I want it to be my reverence reverb and I want this to be stereo in stereo out. I can just have this kind of add it at the audio connections level. So these aren't necessarily defined. These could be routed to additional outputs if needed, but this is just a way to have kind of a, a connection that's going to be for internal routing to effects or to group tracks. So this would just allow you to do it. It's really the same thing if I added, you know, an effects channel here. So if I just add, an effects channel, let's say a delay. I'll come over here, let's just throw in a mod machine delay. And now that we've done that, we could see that the, the uh, mod machine delay has been automatically added to this list. So we can change the routing uh, if we wanted this effect to go out of a, a separate uh, distinct audio output, or we could just choose to add the effects or groups directly from here as we're kind of setting up all the input and output channels for our particular project. Okay, so, um, all right, so we have a question from uh, John it says, uh, uh, please be patient with me, y'all. So, no problem. Just, you know, every level of question is fine. Can you please demo a simple example of having ready uh, MIDI uh, play it back and add CC data, uh, like one of them in the editor page, and adding expression, mod, attack, release, etc. Cubase 11. All right, so let's go ahead and I'll just do a quick new project. And we'll just start off. Okay, and we'll just quickly add an instrument track and let's just do something maybe like retro log here. Okay, so let's say if I Let's just find a patch that might respond more to some modulation data. Just
course, every patch I pick now is not going to respawn. All right, let me just try maybe a quick pad shop. A lot of those will respond to you. Modulation, just so we can hear the change. more patches if not well there are no one that we could use real quickly sorry starting orchestral one here Okay, here, here's a good patch to show. All right, so let's say if I just wanted to record some of the MIDI data itself, so I could come here and as I would just play, so it's gonna be like really quiet. So let's go back and we could look at this particular phrase. And as we're listening to it, you may notice that it's going to be really quiet because the patch actually would need to respond to uh, modulation data. So if I play it back now and I just move my mod wheel, that we could kind of hear how it responds just to the modulation wheel. So if I wanted to record that information into the part, I could, you know, just click right here, hit record. So click on record. And just an annoying extreme. So now that we've recorded that, that information will show up as modulation data. And that is kind of overlaid directly into the part. And you could change if you wanted that to do a new part or to merge just by clicking on the MIDI record modes. So once you uh, set the MIDI record mode to so that modulation data is now uh, a part of this event. So as I move the event in time, the modulation is all kind of contained within this event right here. Um, <clears throat> now you also go on to ask, um, so that's how you could do like CC data. And if you wanted to draw in, you know, pitch bend, uh, which is technically a system common message, but if you wanted to draw in pitch bend afterwards, you could just come and you know draw the pitch bend in the event so that it will just do a pitch bend as it's playing so at that point you could have pitch bend right there now also you mentioned um so you know that's like adding expression modulation and generally attack release is not something that's kind of MIDI information that's in the part. Um, attack release generally would be within the instrument itself. So you could go to the edit and you could now just, you know, if you wanted to automate attack or release, you could just come over here and if you wanted to just automate the attack and release of each individual part, 
you could automate that. And a lot of times you could control this and, you know, right click and learn a MIDI CC message and record that. And that MIDI controller, like how we recorded the modulation could then in fact, just control the attack or release. So generally like attack release would be within the instrument, modulation, expression, velocity, pitch bend is gonna be within the part and the instrument would respond to that information. Okay, we have a question. In preferences editing project and mix console, what is deep track folding? Okay, so what deep track folding would allow you to do is let's say I wanted to um, let's add eight audio tracks. Okay, so I'm gonna put these into a folder. So I will just right click here, we're gonna move these selected tracks to the new folder and within the folder, I could also uh, add a folder track so let's go ahead and add a folder track and we'll call this guitar. And within this particular track, I could say, okay, I wanted to add a number of audio tracks. So as we wanted to add these tracks, I could now place these tracks into the guitar folder. And within the guitar folder, I could have a number of folder tracks. So this is basically allowing you to work with nested folders, like folders within folders, within folders, within folders. And that's what the deep track folding would allow you to, to work with. Okay, so we have uh, Ranfree from Fort Smith, Arkansas checking in. Thanks for joining us. All right, wonderful to see Jazz Dude on the live stream. All right, and we have Matt checking in from London. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have a question, kind of follow-up question from John. Um, so Greg, uh, related to my earlier question about drawing modulation in the editor, I can't see the plot moving live. I will see it after the fact, uh, is that the case? So if we wanted to, you know, check out our part here. So let's say I, I'm looking at my modulation. A lot of times when we have our modulation data, um, we may not see it recorded. So if I come select, I'll just delete all of my modulation data here. So if I record my modulation data, so I'll just record MIDI and I move my mod wheel. So it's recording, but I don't see it reflected. And then when I stop, um, often, you know, we could just, let's just come right over here. So I'll record. Okay, so you may not see the modulation data appear until you actually just put it into like uh, to record and able within the MIDI editor. So now if I record, let's just try recording some modulation data. So now that this is enabled here, this little icon, I will undo that recording. So let's say, Without this little record in editor icon, I can record, move my mod wheel up and down. And then when I stop, often you see the modulation, but you could now just make sure that you record within the editor. And as we record, if this little option is checked, now you'll see the, the controller data written within the editor itself. So. Just make sure that within the editor, if it's open, that you have the record and editor option enabled. All 
Okay, so we have a question from Jan. Uh, how does Greg usually use Howling in six in the most efficient way as a synth, not a sampler, unlock, uh, unlock, unlock windows or not? An easy way to add flex phraser instrument that lacks flex phraser. So, you know, when we work, start working with Halion, you know, Halion is probably, you know, one of the, you know, biggest beasts of a virtual instrument. But we'll show you a couple of things, like if you wanted to add um, Halion. So we kind of go with Halion, you know, it is kind of, you know, a monster tool of a sampler, but it's also kind of dedicated to, you know, being able to create your own sounds, create your own virtual instruments and sample directly into it. So if I just want it to, and some of the things that you'll see that are kind of unique to Halion is you could actually just kind of take, you know, different windows of the program and you could actually choose to undock different windows. So while you have this part of the instrument open, you could move parts of the instrument around. So a lot of times I will tend to try to keep things um, as if I'm doing a sampling session, I may have, you know, different parts docked and you could have different um, kind of window configurations. So if you wanted to just click here, you could just uh, like different screen sets. So you could actually have, you know, you know, a basic or more advanced or an extended, uh, you know, relationship directly there. Now, if we wanted to just kind of starting, you know, let's say with a sampler and, and like a synthesizer sound inside of um, Halion and adding the flex phraser. So I will just come over, let's find something. Okay, so let's just do something from simple. Okay, so let's say I just have kind of a, a simple string patch. Um, so a lot of times what you could do is just kind of, and this has one in it already, but all you'd have to do is right click <coughs> excuse me about that um so if you right click then you could load uh if you go to new so i'm going to select this patch here and then we could go to new midi module and as we want to just go to midi module you could go to player and now you could incorporate the flex phraser. So if I wanted to edit the flex phraser, um, at this point we could choose to, okay, I'm going to, we have flex phraser one here. So I could just load up a particular phrase. Um, so let's say I just wanted to now come over here to um, maybe like a quick string So now I'm just holding down a chord, as you can see in the keyboard below, and the flex phraser is just automatically doing this. So anytime that you kind of have an instrument, you know, just come over here, select the instrument, right click, go to new, to MIDI module, to player, and add a flex phraser. And then you could use a flex phraser on any synthesizer, any sample based instrument without any issue. And, you know, while you're there, just kind of, oh, what else can I do? So I could add, you know, drum pads. We could add, you know, different modulation matrixes, you know, mega trig functions, different modifiers, uh, randomizing. So all sorts of different functions can be added just like that.
Okay, we have a question. Uh, hi, I have a problem with L function on my mix. Uh, it didn't work well, could you help me? So what the L is, is gonna be for the listen bus. So if we have a project open, um, I'll just select. And the L functionality, the listen bus could be set up, uh, you know, there could be a couple of little tweaks that could make a big difference. So let's say if we have a project playing here. Now, most of us are familiar with when we solo a particular track that the other tracks get muted. So if I go to the bass, So once you're in the control room, you could click on the main tab here and this will open up some additional functions. So instead of hitting the S, I could just hit the L. And what that's going to do is dim. You know, so first we want to make sure that we have the listen enabled. But what this will do is dim the other tracks down so you can still hear the bass and still hear the backing tracks, but we hear the backing tracks underneath the bass. So that way, you know, if I take it all the way down to infinity, it's basically the same as a solo, but as I bring this listen dim level up, so I say, okay, let's just listen to guitars. And when you do this, often it's gonna be... So like if I solo the guitar here, this has a like an amp rack on it. So often if I did a listen and hit the L button, we would hear without the effects, If but if you wanted to hear the insert effects, we could just click on this little, uh, you know, activate to use the after fader listen mode. So now we can hear it with the effects. So we'll have both guitars and I can bring up the air tracks. But if this is turned off, we don't hear it going through the inserts and EQs. So now, so soloing, mutes the other ones, listen will dim. So make sure that you have, you know, listen enabled. You could set where you want to be pre, you know, at what point in the signal chain it's being monitored or what the, and the dim amount. So as we just listen, so I want to listen to a vocal. So give those suggestions a try, but you know, if you don't see those settings, it's, you know, they're kind of underneath. So instead of like bringing the top up, click on the main tab and that will expose those functions for you for the listen bus. Uh, so you see a question, hi, in the drum editor, global track is not possible or do I need to set something? So the global tracks are going to be, you know, primarily enabled. Uh, I think it's just limited to the main key editor. So let me just check just to make sure. So I think it's intended just for the main. Uh, so let me just add another. So when we switch it over to 
drum editor. I don't think that you're going to have the global modes. So it's just limited to the main key editor where you could see the global tracks. Um, so it's not designed to work. I think we may see some more kind of expansion in the future, uh, but it currently only does the global tracks in the MIDI key editor at this time. Okay, so we have a question. How to get the MIDI notes to follow the MIDI window when have to move the event in the timeline? Okay, let me just... Okay, so if I have this part selected, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question entirely. So I'm not sure if you have the ability of, uh, you know, you could probably watch me answer this incorrectly and be completely off. So, okay, so when I, you know, come and move the MIDI events here, I could see it reflected in the MIDI editor automatically and that's when this is synchronized so if i move this um you know it do doesn't affect that so now i could as i have the event selected we can see that and i move the events we see the you know the editor reflect those changes automatically for you So it's just how to get the MIDI notes to follow the MIDI window when have to move the event in the timeline. So let me know if that is not, but it seems like here that the MIDI events are following it when the event is moved in the timeline. So I'm not sure if you have multiple parts selected, but if you have just that event selected on the project window and you have like maybe the lower zone open here, that we could see those changes automatically uh, reflected between those two. But if yours is doing something different, let me know. Okay, so we have a question is I am kind of new to these Cubase live streams. Uh, so I got a, I, so I got a question. Is there a specific topic on the agenda or is it all spontaneous and user question driven? So it's user question driven. So you know, we have lots of, you know, specific tutorials on stuff, but what we wanted to have was, you know, just the ability for users to ask questions and users learn from other users questions and this way you could actually get your particular question answered. Um, so we want it to be a bit more interactive than other formats. <clears throat> okay, so we have a question. How do I combine multiple audio tracks into one track? So there's a number of ways of doing this. One is, you know, if I wanted to take all of my background vocals, you know, we could just come over here and you know we could do an export audio mix down and at this point if i just have let's say all of my background vocals and i will just put my left and right locators let me just close this window quickly find some events all right so let's say I wanted to take these events here and bounce down all these gang background vocals to, um, you know, to one particular file. So I could, in lighter versions, we could choose to solo all of the tracks. Okay, and since those are soloed, we could choose to export audio mix down. I will do a stereo mix. Uh, you could give the file anything you want. So say, gang vox. And what I want to do is to just uh, create an audio track. 
So once I do that, we'll add it to the queue and we'll say start queue export. And this will take all the files and bounce it down to one particular audio file at the bottom here. So if I just wanted to listen to this. No canto hit the road. So that's a mix down of all the files. Another method of doing this might be to also just select multiple tracks. And we could go to the edit to render in place. Let's go to our render settings. Uh, and I could here I could choose to include different processing options, uh, but we could choose to mix down to one file. Um, so I'll include my different channel settings and we'll give it called Fox Gang for the name. And we hit render. We could choose to mute source events or, you know, keep source events unchanged. So I'll just render and I will take all of the selected events. And now that will just render that um, right here. So directly underneath. So that those are two ways of kind of doing the same thing. So different approaches to, you know, bounce down to... Uh, to bounce multiple tracks down to one file. Okay. And I, I see uh, David's also a continuation of the question. It says, I'm doing an orchestral um, and want to combine several string parts into one stereo file. So yeah, that, that will work as well. Right. And we see other people providing different, you know, other solutions as well. All right. So we see Millard Brown is gay. Today's revelation dim on listen. I didn't even know that was there. So we'll give you that feature free. Millard, thanks for joining us. Hope you're doing well. All right, so we have James from Gloomy LA. So Okay, so I just see uh, from Alex is probably about the control room. I try to activate everything in the control room, but it doesn't work when I activate the listen bus. Thank you anyway. So, you know, the listen bus is kind of just underlying technology, so I'm not sure, you know, you know, you make sure that you're clicking on you know, the L button on a particular channel because nothing will be sent to the listen bus until you click on the L. So uh, once you do that, that should, you know, activate it for you. So just kind of clicking on, you know, listen bus here in a control room won't do anything because you have to send, uh, send an audio source to the listen bus. So if you're just kind of turning it on here, you know, you, you're, it's not kind of functioning fully. All right, so we have Millard Brown's giving coffee beans away today. So that's, that's kind. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, what should I use, Quick Control or VST Quick Control? I use VSL with Cubase 11. You know, so when we have, you know, Quick Controls, so probably, you know, if, you know, if we wanted Quick Controls for a particular, like, audio track, you know, we could have, you know, this would be kind of like track Quick Controls. But if we had it set up for an instrument, so let's say I go to Retrolog um, and we add this will have our quick controls 
for the instrument, but we could still kind of just toggle back and forth if you wanted to control the volume and pans. There's different presets for the quick controls, but really, you know, as soon as you load up the instrument, that's when the quick controls will set. So you could have the quick controls kind of mapped to your eight go-to parameters, you know, and that could be going to any audio or MIDI destination. So, so if you wanted to do it with internal plugins or if you're using VSL, you know, it'll kind of function the same way. All right, so John Costigan uh, wants people to squeeze the like button. So that's how we're able to continue to do these live streams is because people watching it and and likes and subscribers. So if you guys want to, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. Or if you haven't liked the live stream, that enables us to keep doing these live streams as, as a free resource for our customers. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, Greg, is there any plans for Steinberg to bring back the Mid-X8 and have some new drivers for it? We need uh, the time stamping back. Also, anyone running Cubase 10 with Mid-X8 on Mac Mojave? Thank you. Um, so I still, you know, run my Mid-X8, you know, and it used to be kind of that the time stamping, you know, was, was very unique when it was introduced. And then a lot of that functionality did get introduced into the timing kernel of the operating systems. So I haven't heard of any plans for the mid X eight. You know, I know that we still have people that want uh, a large uh, format, you know, MIDI interface, but you know, they, they tend not to sell well. So, you know, when you kind of look at the economies of scale, you know, there's not, you know, in our world of VST instruments and their popularity and every device coming with a USB MIDI port, you know, when you look at the number of sales from like a product planning, it's hard to justify, but I will, you know, pass it along as feedback from the live stream. So, um, but I haven't heard of any plans for a new large format MIDI interface. Um, I know some of my friends are using was the I connectivity uh, that works over Ethernet uh, with with good success for really large MIDI setups. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, I have Cubase Pro 11, and when I import a stereo file, it separates automatically the file in two mono files. All previous Cubase is imported it as a stereo file, so I think this will just be covered in a preference. So let's go to editing, and I think in audio. Um, so make sure that in editing audio that you don't have split channels activate it so you know cubase will still allow you to import a stereo file without any problems but if you have editing audio in that preference if you have split channels that will automatically split the channels for you so and there's also uh you know you could have this is basically the options dialog box so just check editing audio and check that split channels isn't checked Okay, so I just see from uh, David Nelson, this is awesome, what are you doing? So unfortunately with the, uh, I was probably doing something 15, 20 minutes ago. So, but if if you can, I may be able to tell you what I was doing. If you could just uh, let me know what it was, if you need to, so. Okay, so question, Greg, I must have done a shortcut or something and the buttons R and W and layers uh, disappear from my tracks and now I have 
the insert, send into place. Uh, I searched in preferences, didn't find. So if we have, let me just make sure we have it. Okay, so when we want to see like, you know, the W and R here, this is actually controlled from the track control settings. So if we wanted to right click, we could go to track control settings. And just at this point, you could say, I want it to, you know, we see that we have hidden controls as well as visible controls. So, you know, if I wanted the, just pull out the ones, let's say R and W. So let's say, you know, read and write enable. So if we just remove those and hit apply, you can see that they disappear. But if I wanted inserts, EQs and sends to appear, then, you know, we could uh, hit apply and now I could see all of those on a particular track. So, or we could remove that. And as we work with this also, you may, something else to be aware of is that they could be on two different lines. So we could say, okay, my channel configuration, these could be on kind of, you know, track name like row one or row two. So as we, uh, come over and adjust kind of the height. So sometimes you may be able to kind of see stuff in different rows, but just right click and go to track control settings and you could hide or, you know, make visible different elements and change the order as what works best for you. All right, so we have Michael Teams checking in from Weatherford, Texas. So thanks for joining us. And I think the virtual free ice cream gets started with Michael. So, Right, sorry, my time, my chat line, my chat, live chat jumped on me. Okay. Just trying to find my my spot. Okay, so we have a question. Can I use example audio files in Groove Agent SE5 to toggle mode? I'd like to press a keyboard key to play the sample until I press the key a second time and it should stop. All right, let's take a look at it. So I'll add an instance of Groove Agent SE. And I'll take just our little vocal file that we just created here. Hit the road. Rock. Roll. Okay. No control. Hit the road. Rock. Rock. Roll. Roll. No control. Hit the road. Hit the road. Rock. Rock. All right. Roll. I'll just mute that for now. All right. Of course I picked. All right, so let's come over here to, um, all right, so we're gonna go to sample and we have where we see one shot. Um, and here we could just do, I'll just do just a very, let me just do a very small file here quickly, just for, so we don't have to wait 30 seconds for it.
Okay, so now we have. Just find something even shorter. Pick something that was nearly as long. So let me just jump to a different library here. Okay, so when we go to our sample tab, this is where we could go into our different playback modes. So, um, so it says toggle mode, I like to press the keyboard to play the sample until I press the key. Uh, the second time it should stop. So we have one shot. Um, so I don't think that there's a mode for that. So if I just wanted to have no loop and I play the sample, so that will play until I released a key. Uh, we could also just adjust the control room down a little bit. And if I just do continuous, so that will continue to play till that will just kind of hold it down until we could also do just, you know, until release. So as soon as we release here, or if you wanted it to just um, alternate, which will play. So let's say, let's do like a one shot mode. So there it's gonna play. And if I play the second MIDI note, it will uh, automatically just re-trigger the sample. So let's say if I do, so here it's gonna let go. It'll play through until I think to the end of the sample under no loop. And if I want to come here with continuous, so it's gonna can play the sample. And when it gets to the end, we'll kind of continue to loop, I believe. But I don't think I see the exact scenario that you have. So say until release. So as long as I hold this down, it'll play until I send it a MIDI note off message. Uh, and then we have alternate, which will play it forward. And then I think it's gonna play it backwards to alternate. And then we could have that until release, but let me see if there's any other. So I don't see the, like, you know, play the MIDI note, you know, play it until the MIDI note message uh, starts again. But let me just check to see if there's maybe a way to do it, like within an exclusive group. Um, So I don't think that that kind of works. In that way, so I don't see a way, but I could kind of just continue to play around with it, but I don't think it's going to play because usually a MIDI note message, you know, is designed to, you know, play the sample until you release or and have it loop so that, you know, it's kind of could be counterintuitive sometimes to, you know, transmit a MIDI note message to have it stop. Um, but there may be a way of doing it. If you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could play around with it some more. Uh, so question uh, from Bazad, uh, what resolution format would you recommend for quality recording? 44.1, 48K, 96K, et cetera. So, you know, many of my, you know, top engineer friends, like I had this question, I think Tan May was asking me 
like you know what sample rate Zed uses for all of his productions. It ends up he's just doing everything at forty four point one. Um, if you're doing something that's kind of squeaky clean, maybe classical oriented stuff, or maybe like think Allison Krauss Americana type stuff, 96 K could benefit from that, but it does take, you know, twice as much processing resources for plugins to work. So there's, that's the downside. Yeah, I would take, you know, each case and see, you know, generally when I find that someone's file doesn't sound good, I haven't really found it to be the sample rate as being the issue. So I think you could get great results with any of those sample rates. But if you're doing something, you know, very specific for, you know, classical, you know, if you're doing something recording that's going to Telarc, I would do one, you know, 96K. Uh, but realize that there are some disadvantages down the line in capturing that. So I think that you can get great sounding audio at 44.1 or 48K as well. And we've all heard it on CDs. So Okay, a uh, question from John related to my quick control question. If I have rack instruments and need to get my CC from my external library, how do I control? So, you know, these are going to be, you know, let's add just a quick empty MIDI track. And as we do this with the quick controls... You know, as we work with this, you could just say, you know, you have a list of all of your MIDI CCs. So if your rack module or your rack mount device or your hardware keyboard, you could just assign your eight uh, MIDI CCs. So you say, okay, it responds to MIDI controller 52. It also responds to, you know, I want it you know, controller 31. So once you kind of go to a blank quick control, you can see all of your MIDI CCs available so that you could send it out to your hardware devices. So just do that. So just double click in a blank field and you could set the MIDI message that it's going to be transmitting. And you could have the quick control messages, you know, have your eight quick controls, not only for your virtual instruments, but for your hardware instruments the same way. All right, so Tim Weinheimer wants people to hit the like button, not to fondle it, so. All right, so we have a question um, from uh, from Norway. How do you transpose in Cubase with a normal keyboard? You have transpose buttons that you can push like plus one or four, minus one, minus five, after what key you want to play. All right, so if I wanted to transpose, let's say I have a keyboard controller that doesn't have a transpose function. So I will just quickly open up an instrument So when I want to do this, we could, if we wanted to transpose in Cubase, if our keyboard controller doesn't have that, we could go to the input transformer and we could set this to local or to global. We could activate the module. So I say, I want to transform under function. We'll say type is equal to note. And how we want to affect that note is we're gonna take value one, which is the pitch and we could subtract one. So I could just come here. So now that it's playing a B. So this is just transposing. So say if I want to 
hitting the same note originally and now transposing it down directly here. So that's how you could do it. So once again, go to the input transformer. You could set it to local if you want it just on that particular track or globally. Uh, make sure that one of the modules is active. Function transform, we'll say type is equal to note. And in the action target, we want to say value one is, we'll say subtract and or add, and that would allow you to do your transposition. All right, so we have a question from John Costigan. Um, after going through the Cubase index, I wondered what is the best practice of drum replacement for both MIDI and audio tracks? All right, so if we have like MIDI tracks, um, let's say if I have See if this has MIDI drums in it. Okay, so. All right, so let's say we'll go back to this song. Here we have some MIDI drums. So if I wanted to do like MIDI drum replacement, I would just kind of come. So let's say I have this and I'll turn this up a little louder so we could all hear it a little easier. So, you know, if I have my MIDI drums, I could just kind of choose different kits. So let's say I wanted to come over here to... So now I'm just gonna replace And if I wanted to listen to that in context. I should have told you you were out of tune. Whatever you did, that was okay. Up until now, that was okay. Say what I'm So that's how you could do it for MIDI. And if I wanted to do like changing sounds of acoustic drums, um, I'll just jump over to another project here. And we'll do just a quick uh, listen to. So if I don't like, you know, if I didn't like the kick drum recording here, I have just a, a groove agent kit loaded up with. Samples. So if I wanted to, if I didn't like the kicks I had here, I would double click go to hit points, let's edit the hit points, and we'll kind of just zoom in a bit. And we want to have the hit points kind of fall wherever there's the actual kicks. So you could address the threshold, and I'll just say, we're going to create MIDI notes. So I have the my drum instrument defined here, so I'm gonna say create MIDI notes. And we'll say we're gonna retain the dynamic velocity. I'm gonna put it on to C1 onto the selected track. So I hit OK. This has now generated a whole kick drum pattern. So if we open up Groove Agent, we can see the kick is playing here. 
and I will mute the audio kick drums. So the same exact timing. So if I wanted to even make this kick louder or tune it. And or combine that with the other tracks, the samples and blend them together. So that's how you could kind of replace uh, MIDI and audio drum parts pretty easily. All right, wonderful to see Pablo on the live stream from Galicia, España. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, the mute all tracks button in the upper right toolbar, I've accidentally hit it and had a stressful time remembering guessing which tracks were originally muted and which were not. So let's take a look. So let's say if I had some tracks muted here. So let me just see if... Um, in the upper right toolbar, so. So I'm not sure if it's this. Or if like. Just seeing if I could find the See if I could find the mute function. So um, just seeing maybe uh, just from Alpha Drums. So it says the mute all tracks button in the upper right hand toolbar. So maybe uh, Alpha Drums, if you could just let us know where the uh, the upper right hand mute toolbar is. Okay, so there's the you know, disable this. I, I'm not sure if it's this mute bar here. Um, so if you want it to hide it, you could just, you know, come right over here and it's just going to be the state buttons. So when you go to the setup window, just go to the state buttons and then you could hide that. So I think that's maybe what you're kind of getting at reading kind of your next question, your next comment. And I just see uh, your comment. Why is track muting not an undoable function? Seems to me it could be included in the very useful mix history. Um, you know, what you could do before, if you accidentally do it, I know you said you accidentally do it, but you could take a mixer snapshot. So while you're in the mix console, if you took a snapshot, you know, that should be able to, you know, allow you to work and recall the settings before you did it. But I realize that you may not take a snapshot before accidentally hitting a function. But if you don't want that function there, go to the settings cogwheel and just uncheck the state buttons. Then that will disappear. Okay, so we have a question. How to bounce MIDI track quickly? Please show. All right, so if we look at, uh, I think we have our MIDI drums here. 
And if I wanted to bounce that, I would just go to edit and let's choose render in place. And we have render settings. So at this point I could just make it all one event. We can mute the source events and I'll just choose render. And at that point, that'll take that MIDI information. It's gonna create an audio file directly underneath and that's really all you have to do. So I could take all of that and when we go to listen to our rendered MIDI, that's just the kick drum from the from the MIDI part and we could choose to mute it. I could also choose to disable the tracks as well with different settings. So. Sorry, my chat field jumped on me. All right. All right, so we see that uh, we solved Franz's question, so that's great. All right, reading through comments. So we see another one, you are so great, I activated it all. Maybe it's a problem with the monitor setting and section audio connection, so. All right, so we see uh, from Christian D68, CC messages on quick control. Wow, revelation uh, of the first hour. So that's great. I haven't set that up in a long time. So, all right, so we have Fred checking in from Prague. His question is uh, Does Cubase Pro, does Cubase 11 Pro video player drop 4K to 1080? And if so, when considering, when rendering out, does it render the cropped image, the 4K image, or 1080? Uh, version of the non-crop. So I, it's going to render a 1080p. So I'm not sure if it will actually import a 4K video. Uh, so it might have to be converted to 1080p, but it's not going to render out a 4K video. It's going to render out a 1080p resolution. So Okay, so I think this is uh, about CC messages on a quick control. Does it also work with on off CC 80 to 83? So, you know, it, one other thing that you could do with MIDI CC control, if you, if you need to kind of get it set up for, if you need to, to toggle between different values. So say if we have a MIDI track, so, you know, that will just, you know, transmit whatever CC message. But sometimes you realize that you may need to actually set uh, a particular event. So if we go to MIDI inserts, something that might help if you go to MIDI control, not MIDI echo, but to MIDI control, here you could say, okay, I want like this default to start at, you know, 100 for modulation and at this point this will when you play the track this could automatically transmit specific MIDI CCs as a starting off point which is helpful for like sample libraries strings where you you know where you wanted it to be you know starting from a known starting point so you could use that so if you wanted to set something to 80 or 83 and I think you could use multiple instances of that if needed so that may help in that scenario. All right, so we just see uh, 
for Michael Pierce's Just Looked Up Tell Arc. I have some of their stuff and never even noticed, but they're great recordings. I'm pretty much always 24 bit 48K at work. And we go higher when requested for the most part. So, yeah, Tell Arc is just wonderful recording. So, it's a snobby, uh, amazing classical label. So, all right. So, we have Graham checking in from Royal Wuton Bassett in the UK. And it's a weekend. He wants to celebrate with Cubase. So that's great. Okay, so we have a question from John. Uh, how about transposing all notes from within the editor? All right, so we could do that quite easily. You know, if we have a lot of MIDI notes here. All right, so if I wanted to transpose, you know, there's, so let's just kind of come right over here. So if I would just, if I had the notes selected, so let's say I just select all the notes, I could, you know, one of the things you could do is just go to your pitch and you could just kind of hover directly over here. You could also have the notes and move them up using the up or down arrow keys on your computer keyboard. If you hold down shift with those keys, you could uh, have it automatically go an octave. There's a transpose setup function as well. So you could choose to, you know, I want it to go up three semitones. You could do that. You could also, if you're so inclined, you could say, okay, I want it to keep notes in a specific range or I want it to do scale correction. So. I was in C major and now I wanted to transpose to, you know, C, you know, Phrygian scale, you know, you could set that up as well. So a number of different transposing functions, but you know, probably the arrow keys are most widely used and the shift plus arrow key just for, you know, I used to be the king of that when I was doing lots of MIDI programming, you know, layer apart an octave up, layer apart an octave down, you know, bring your velocity, adjust velocities accordingly. So that's a really handy way of transposing as well. All right. So Fred Robinson wants everyone to give that like button a slap. So. All right, so we see Scott uh, Vaudry, I believe, or Vaudry says, uh, very nice, I finally caught one of these. So welcome to the live stream, and we hope to see you on more future live streams, and if you have any questions, just ask them in the chat field. Okay, uh, question, uh, if I keep recording track one, two, three, what is the easiest way to make them all in time, quantized, per quantized perfectly, same timing? Okay. Let's do a new project here. And I'll revert this one as I've destroyed it. Okay, so I'll just duplicate this track a couple times. Okay, so let's say I just wanted to quickly record. Put a click track on. Okay, so I have quarter notes there, and let's do another recording here. OK, 
Okay, and just my atonal composition. All right, we'll do another recording. Yep. Just select the previous next track. So if I wanted to quantize all these to the same value, so let's say, okay, I want these all to be quantized to, you know, a quarter note, I could just come right over here, select the events and just hit Q. So that would apply the same quantization to all of the values. There's also kind of an AQ. So if I wanted to, let's say I'm going to set the, the automatic quantize to eighth notes. And we see people do this kind of for drums where, okay, we're just gonna record. And now I have go. And we go back. Now, since I set that to AQ, that would quantize on input. So let me listen back. So you could do stuff like that as well. And if you go, oh, that was like the worst. Um, I wanted to go back to the original. If you go even back to the quantize here, you could, even though we quantized on input, we could just click on reset quantize and now it'll just be back from the original data. So, you know, to, just, to quantize the same value to multiple parts, select the parts and just hit Q. And that's really kind of all you have to do. Okay, so we see Gareth on the live stream, so welcome. I hope the bass line was okay. Nice tune from Mike Teens. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hi, I'd really like to change the scroll direction of shift plus mouse wheel uh, in most Oz, if you example shift plus scroll down the screen goes right in cubase it goes left so let's say okay so i'm not sure if it's user assignable so let's say okay so i'm holding down shift and So I'm going up and we can see that now when I go up, it's going to the right. And I know that there were some changes with 1102. Um, so let's say if I take these events and let me just duplicate them a couple times. All right, so we'll have our events here. So now I hold down shift and I'm moving my mouse scroll wheel up and it's going to the right. And when I hold down shift and, okay, so it says, uh, in most laws, if you example, shift plus scroll down, the screen goes to the right. So I don't think that this is uh, user assignable. Let me just see if, if it mimics, if changing it in this system, and this might be different on Windows. So let's just say, We change the scroll direction if that All right so now I'm going down it goes to the right and I'll go back to that system preference So now when I go down, it goes to the left. So it kind of follows the system preference uh, that's set in your computer. So, but I don't know of a way to, you know, flip it inside of Cubase, but give that a try.
Okay, we have a question. Uh, when soloing a track with effects send, how do I just how do I stop the other tracks that feed that effects from playing? Okay, so let's take a look. All right, so let's say we have reverb here on the vocal. And I'm gonna put that same reverb on the piano here. Just make this a really kind of super obvious reverb. Something just annoyingly big. Okay. So these, the piano is feeding. So I'm not hearing the vocal bleeding through. I'm just gonna read the question. Um, okay, so it says, uh, when selling a track with effects send, how do I stop the air tracks that feed that effects is from playing. So, you know, when I'm just doing this here, let's say between the piano and the vocal. So I'm not hearing any of the piano. When I saw the piano, I'm not hearing the, the vocal in there. And I'll show you, let's take, I'll just take a look at the mix console and see if it's like a pre or post fader, pre or post fader send kind of thing. So let's say if I go back to, we have our vocal. And I'll move this to. So you've been switching from pre and post fader. So it, I'm not hearing it kind of bleed through. One other trick that I'll point out to people uh, here while we're here, but you know, let me know if I'm doing something differently. But we often get the question like, how could I just listen to the reverb without hearing the other tracks? Like if I solo the reverb, here, if we solo the reverb, you know, at that point, that would solo everything. So let me, I'm just going to reread the question. All right. So it says when soloing a track, so that doesn't seem to be bleeding. But if I solo the reverb, I would hear everything feeding into that reverb plus the original tracks. But if I only wanted to hear the reverb, all you'd have to do, and not like the source tracks, but just a reverb, you click on the L button. That allows you to listen to only 
to the reverb, but sewing the tracks doesn't seem to feed everything else. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm just using a standard effects channel track. I'm not sure if you're using a group track to do it. So, um, you know, so see if you're using an effects channel track or a group track, maybe that could, that's treated differently. Okay, so we see from at the source studios, uh, please Cubase come out with a way to turn on and off multiple slash all external effects, outboard analog gear at the same time with one click as well as overall syncing all at once. So I'll, I'll pass that along. One thing that a lot of people, you know, maybe don't realize, and I've learned this recently myself, if you get to the audio connections, a lot of your external effects and external instruments, they could be saved as favorites that could be kind of called up. So you don't have to sit there and do all the routing, but you know, and it also could depend on, you know, what effects are on a particular track. So that's why the, you have to kind of manually measure the delay. Um, but I'll pass that along as feedback. Okay, so we see uh, from Sven Isaacson, a tip regarding sample rates. FabFilter just published an excellent video on the subject here on YouTube named Sample Rates, The Higher the Better, right? Highly recommending with surprising conclusions. Okay, so, uh, I see from uh, Taylor, do we need to re-ask questions that were asked before your chat box jumped? So I don't think I lost any questions, but if I missed one, feel free to ask it. If, if it, you know, I try never to, uh, you know, even if I don't know the answer, it's a tough question. I'll try to tackle it anyway. But if I missed a question, Taylor, let me know. But sometimes when it jumps, I could go back and find my place where I was. So I don't think I lost anything. Okay, as my chat field just jumps on me. Okay. Okay, so um, so I've seen before we have plugins open on the bottom, similar to Ableton. Is this true? I currently have 10.5 Pro. So I don't think we could have the plugins open on the bottom. You could of course have, you know, if you have plugins on a particular track that you could, you know, double click and see, uh, you know, the editor window kind of wherever you last left it. So it, they're not kind of anchored to the bottom, but they're kind of anchored to their last open position, but you could have, you know, all of your mixing, your inserts and sends, as well as, you know, if you have, you know, your sample editor, or MIDI editor, sampler control or chord pads, but I don't run Ableton, but I, I so it, I, but it's not where the plugins automatically show up in the lower zone, so. Okay, so I think I found the uh, the correct mute button from the upper left hand side, not the upper right hand side. So thanks for confirmation. All right, great to see sub four hundred three on the live stream. Okay, so we have a question from Sub403. When I hold the command button Mac and use the scroll wheel, the event zooms in or out. Is there a way to stop this from happening? Um, so, you know, if, you know, I guess the, you know, so if, you know, so we could zoom in and out this way, which is uh, kind of a handy thing. Let me see if there is a way to deactivate it. Most people like that, but let's see if we go to tool modifiers. Um, let's 
So I'm not sure if it's... A way to turn that off but most people kind of like the convenience of that especially for doing just like a little bit of editing where it's like okay I'm here and I just wanted to you know zoom in a little more without having to switch tools so um so I think that's kind of a fixed thing so I don't know a way to turn that off sometimes you could remap those by going into the tool modifiers um but I think that's so let me just see if that yeah so I think that's kind of just a maybe a fixed function so um but I'll, I could pass that along. But I could always say just, you know, don't don't hold down the scroll wheel. You know, it's kind of a conscious, you know, but <clears throat> I understand where it could could be a little odd for edit, some editing situations, but I think if you make it work for you, that it makes a lot of sense and it's very convenient. All right, we see Michael Pierce is going to leave for an hour to talk about trigonometry. All right. All right, great to see Jeff Zabelski on the live stream. Okay, so we have a question. Where can I get serious tutorials about electronic music production? So, you know, I think YouTube is your oyster. Um, that's going to be kind of, I'm sure you could find everything there. So, you know, there's lots of, you know, probably zillions of hours of tutorial videos. So I think you could probably get the same out of that as, you know, or if you wanted to hire someone as a, you know, a personal instructor, you, you know, that would be a good thing. But I think if you're kind of a bit industrious that you could find a lot of information on YouTube, you know, check out like the Cubase Nation Discord. All right, so we have a question. I've been trying to figure out why I'm only getting the output sounds in one ear only. I am not tech savvy at all. Please help, UR22C. So if you're using like the UR22C and it's your, I assume you're listening to it through headphones, it could be that your audio connections uh, go to your outputs and make sure that you on your stereo output that you have both the left and right channel defined. So if, if you're using control room, you could just do that here in a control room. Um, but with, you know, if you are using maybe a lighter version of Cubase that doesn't have the control room, it could be that your UR24C is only has one of the channels or maybe it, they're both set to, you know, so one of these may be not set to the correct uh, connection so you probably want to say to mix left and mix right in your outputs and then you should be able to hear both channels it could also be I get this a lot where someone has a headphone connection with a little like 3.5 millimeter mini jack and they're going into the quarter inch TRS jack of the the headphone jack on a UR22C and it's the wrong connector so if you have other headphones that have a quarter inch cable i would try that but if you you know are going just there's a chance that if you're using an adapter that the adapter is not feeding both channels to your headphones but only feeding one channel because it's the wrong adapter All right, so Philippe Oliveri, Oliveira uh, wants everyone to slap the like button. So don't disappoint him. All 
All right, so we have a question. This is uh, my first live, live first time catching one of these live streams. I'm glad I found it. Uh, would like to know how I could get on the mailing list to know of the stream in the future. So generally we do them on Tuesdays and Fridays starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. And the easiest way to get notified is just to subscribe to the channel. So make sure you hit the like button and that you uh, just subscribe to the channel and then you'll get notified of future live streams as we start them and you, you could get notified that way. So welcome to the live stream. We hope to see you on future ones. All right, so we see from uh, Laser Wolf, uh, hello, just hopping in. What are we talking about? So we're just kind of going through any questions that people have on Steinberg software. So. Okay, so we see a question uh, from Jordan Bassett. Uh, how to compensate together when editing multiple stems at once? I example drums, you put all the tracks in a folder, turn on group editing, show lanes for all the tracks, and then use the comp tool. That will definitely work. One of the things that I like to do for kind of doing multiple events is you know using track versions. And you could kind of toggle between track versions and lanes as you see fit quite easily. So let's say if I'm here and I just want it to take all of my drums and let's duplicate those tracks. Okay, or let's say I'll just come here. Let me see what the best way of doing this is. So I'll copy all these. And let's say if I wanted to select all of the different parts here, we could just choose to go to, all right, so let's say I'll just duplicate the version and let's duplicate the version. All right, so you know, if we wanted to just switch between like different performances, we could do that here. And if you wanted to at that point say, you know, at this point in time, we're going to split, you know, you could say, I just want to switch these now, you know, at this point, you know, we could make kind of a copy of all of these so let's say uh it, so i'll just do a couple of cuts here so you know when we have track versions one of the things that you could do is if you've kind of recorded everything in lanes we could go to the project and you see track versions you could create lanes from versions or create versions from lanes. So you could kind of toggle back and forth. So I will come here. We have all these selected. I'm going to do a new version. And what I want to do is just say, I'm going to take version one here. And I think if we just select this, we could say, okay, I want to copy these. I haven't done this in a while, so sorry about this. So let's do a copy and at this point we could go back to like our track versions for all of the files let's come here switch back to version 4 and at this point we could just choose to paste at origin so let's do a global paste I think it's option V and then I could 
Okay. The next ones I want it to from measure, you know, 25. All right. So let's say 23 beat two. I wanted a different take. So I'm going to just go to take two. So we'll say 23 take two. And I want it to come right over here. Let's copy all of these drum parts and we'll extend this to. So copy, so just command control C and go back to our track versions here. So sorry, keep messing up. So let's switch our track version back to our global one, come back here and paste. So you could do that quite easily. And I kind of prefer that methodology for multi-track comping as opposed to like maybe guitar solos and vocals i would do lanes i think it's a little cleaner so that those are some different techniques that you could do for that so consider using track versions so the concept is just you know uh create a a new empty version select it copy it and then go to the empty version and then just paste uh paste that origin and that will just kind of put it right back into the exact time spot. So let me know if that makes sense for you, Jordan. Okay, so we see from Jeff Sabelski, who's been downloading Iconica content uh, have all four downloaded sessions and player for iconica folders woodwind strings brass percussion uh, download from my mac as win 64 files but can't register as before transfer folders to pc download won't register um so i check to see if it is you know, if it's if it was a drive that's read, you know, maybe it's a NTFS or FAT32 thing that the drive. So I'm not sure if you, Jeff, if you're able to get all the samples copied over um, and make sure that you have all the different samples copied over. So but check, you know, because sometimes if you put on like a thumb drive, it could be like maybe an NTFS or versus FAT32 kind of scenario. All right, so we see Nicholas saying, I might have a lot of questions about electronic production, then thank you, so. All right, so we have Tony Glasgow's listening on mobile at work today. So it is Friday, so take it a little easy. All right, so um, we see question, guys, can anyone help me with the voice over routing? So, you know, generally it's pretty straightforward. So, you know, any file, you know, so if you have, you know, you know, it's really just kind of adding an audio track. So I'm not sure if there's any particular routing thing that you need to do. So if you're doing, you know, you could have the video, if, if you're doing it to video or not, you could have the video and it's just really adding an audio track, uh, selecting the input where your microphone is connected and you probably are sending it to the main stereo output and just hit add track and that should take care of it for you uh, to do, but that's all the routing, but if there's any specific routing things that you have a question on, just let us know. All right, so we have Gus checking in from London, UK, and as I'm on Cubase 11 Pro and on iMac, how do I get my control room to show the bottom part of the talk button? So, you know, you might have to, so depending, uh, check just to make sure, like, you know, I see sometimes people might have the window kind of, you know, not fully visible in the product, in the product, like on the screen. So one, make sure that you maximize. If you have, 
make sure that you have, you know, and especially you might see that more if it's, if you have different functions open at the top. So let's say if I come here, so you, you might have to, you see this little scroll wheel, depending on what windows are active, you might have to just scroll down, but you could try to just kind of toggle um, and, you know, different windows open. But, you know, if you, you could also want to, you know, let's say we're on main, if you hit like the main tab, that should raise up the talk back button. And worst case scenario is you could always go to your studio menu and just have your control room. And this way you could freely kind of float that around as an independent window. But, you know, make sure that you're not uh like the cubase project window is maximized but you should be able to see the talk back pretty easily okay so from uh, andre allen i'm new to music making i think cubase will be the best what do you think i agree so now cubase you know obviously i work for the company but i think cubase is a really wonderful solutions for just about any type of music or creative task uh, or any audio type of manipulation. So I think it's, you know, probably the most well-rounded program where I see multiple people, you know, purchasing and running multiple programs that never quite connect to each other or never, you know, it's kind of running multiple programs because of deficiencies in workflow, whereas most Cubase users are able to kind of do everything in Cubase. Okay, we have a question. Any way to adjust the timing and velocity to multiple MIDI notes within a chord quickly to mimic a real player's feel? All right, so let's jump back to maybe our piano part that we had in this project here. And I'm just gonna revert it because I added way too much reverb. Okay, so let's say we're looking at our piano part. So if I wanted to just select multiple parts, I could, you know, adjust the velocity for multiple parts, whatever is selected. Um, so if I select a bunch of notes here, I could adjust the velocity up or down. So if I just wanted to do this and say, okay. Or if I wanted to kind of tilt the velocity for crescendo. So if you wanted to just kind of roll back and kind of keep the natural contours, but have a crescendo or even kind of compress the velocity values, you could do that. And, you know, timing, it's just whatever is Selected if I wanted to set my quantized value to eighth notes, you know, I could just set my rhythmic value here. So let's say I want to quantize everything inappropriately to half notes. You know, you could do stuff like that. So just whatever you have selected, you could adjust velocity or quantize based on selections and be able to kind of change the feel quite easily with that. So let me know if that's kind of what you're looking for to adjust uh, Bobby G Productions. All right, so we have Lanewood Studios says checking in late, no worries, no tardy slips are given, so. Just enjoy and hit, and because you're late, don't even, the only punishment is you have to hit the like button immediately. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All 
Okay, so you see uh, what John Barry says, I would hear the vocal feed on the piano. Is there anything in preferences? This is probably to our earlier discussion. Um, let's take a quick look, see if there's anything that might adjust that in preferences. Let's see if maybe mute presends when mute. All right, we'll look here in plugins as well. Okay, so let's see if we do this where we had. So let's say I move it to pre fader. Okay, so let's say. So I'll just put this to the same reverb. All right, so. All right, so let's move this to post fader. Okay, so when it's post fader check, it looks like this preference might do the trick for you. Thanks for asking again. Uh, but go to uh, to VST and try the mute pre-send when mute. So now if I turn that on. And now I'll just switch this to post fader or to pre fader. But we'll toggle that preference again. So mute pre send when mute. And now we'll put it to post fader. So try, try that preference and let us know if that does a trick for you. Sorry, my try out my chat field just moved on me, so. All right, just reading through some comments. Thanks for all the great discussion, and I see we already have 100 likes. That's, that's wonderful, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, from Taylor in preferences, record audio broadcast wave. What is reference value? So let's take a look at it. I think that this is just like another metadata field. Um, let me just hang on just one quick second. I'll just make sure. 
like maybe another uh, searchable file, like a searchable metadata. Yeah, I, I think it's just another searchable uh, metadata field, but I, I'll do some research on it. So you could, you know, put like a project name in it uh, as well as description. So it gives you like three uh, values of metadata that can be embedded as metadata for the audio file. But if you want to email me, I could just, um, I, I could make sure. So we see from Laser Wolf, hi there, do we just ask questions in the chat here? Yeah, that's all we had to do. Uh, so just ask your questions and we'll kind of go through them uh, as in order as best we can. Okay, so we have from Taylor Sapp, uh, in C11, I play C4 on keyboard, it sounds C4. I write in the key editor and it sounds a step higher, no transpose track, no transpose and info line, no transpose and MIDI modifier, where else to look? Okay. Okay, so let's say I'll just, say I'll just go to piano part here really quickly, since we already have a piano loaded up, okay. Okay, so it says I play C4 on keyboard. Uh, and it sounds C4. I write in the key editor, it sounds a step higher. Okay, so let's say if I come here and I write. So now as we play it. All right, so it seems like it's, all right, so it's not, it sounds just, so no transpose track, no transpose in info line, no transpose in MIDI modifier. Where else can I look? Okay. All right, so let's look at the transpose palette. All right, so it's it seems like it's writing C4, but playing it. Um, so Taylor, let me know if that's actually playing, if all the instruments are doing that, or if it's just one particular instrument. Because it could be, let's say if I take this note here, uh, and I put it down to this Hallian sonic part. So I wonder if it's, you know, if it's with Hallian sonic, it could be that, you know, if when I play this note here, that the instrument itself could be transposed. So like in Hallian sonic, if you go to MIDI, you could choose to transpose within the instrument. So if you could let us know, so now if I come here and I transpose, let's say to minus one and I play this particular note, instead of it being, you know, C4, that it's gonna play back kind of a, So now when you play this back, so it could be, so check to see if your actual instrument here is being, is playing back transposed. 
Um, so that's, but it, it is a strange one. So, you know, but it could be that, you know, when you're doing it that, you know, let's say I put in, you know, minus seven. And now that we play back, it's still going to play back as C4, but it's going to play it back transposed. So, and we have our... So, and now when I put it in, you know, I can... So check to see if your instrument is transposed by any chance. And if you want to email me a project file to clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Okay, so we have a question. How do I get the MIDI editor to stay on top? So I think when they went to the docked windows, you know, to the to like the lower zone. That, you know, since the window, the MIDI data could be on top here, that when we go to a full screen view, that I don't think you could set it to always on top here. And I think most people who tend to do this will kind of work with, um, you know, separate monitors. But I think maybe that functionality went away with, with the docking, but I'll make sure to kind of, I'll make a note of that to uh to see if we could get the you know always on top for the key editor mode uh, restored question any way to filter midi channel on input so controller sending some notes on two channels doesn't result in doubled notes on track so yes we can do that uh, very easily just by coming here to the uh, input transformer. So we go to the input transformer. We could set this to be global or local, and you'll see presets here for channel filtering. So you can say pass only MIDI channel one. And basically what that does is it filters any MIDI information on channel other than MIDI channel one. And this will only record MIDI channel one as opposed to multiple MIDI channels being transmitted by your MIDI controller. So once again, go to the input transformer. You could set it globally or locally for a track. Either way will work. And if you go to the presets, you'll see channel filtering and just activate what channel you want to be recording. Every, every other channel will be filtered out. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Paul Claridge. I set up my keyboard to use the keys to control functions. How to switch from controlling to keyboard playing quickly? Okay, so probably the easiest way to do this is just to go to your studio setup and where you have kind of probably your generic remote is just choose the input to not connect it. And then your controller goes from controlling all of your control stuff and then when it's selected to not connect it, your controller is now functioning as a MIDI controller to play virtual instruments and other MIDI devices. Okay, so question. Why sometimes I will have a session that I've been working on and then all of a sudden when I open the session to work, there's latency on guitar tracks while tracking. So latency can be caused by a number of different sources. Uh, the one thing that you know often gets people kind of where they don't anticipate latency is you know we could think of a lot of plugins uh, as having of kind of imposing latency, sometimes not so obviously. And when we look at our um, if you have Cubase Pro, you could actually see this by we have something called a uh, the we'll just open it up here you can see in the large mix console the channel latency display so if i go to on my stereo bus and let's add some inserts uh, such as something that's you know kind of notorious like a multi-band compressor so if you have like a lot of mastering type of plugins you could 
just see exactly what the latency is of that particular uh, plugin. So we can see now when we go to track our guitar, because I have these two plugins active, there's 246.1 milliseconds of latency that's just been added because of these particular plugins. So a quick way to kind of bypass those plugins that are causing latency on your guitar recording. So you you know you just kind of throw a couple plugins on your master bus, a limiter, you know, those plugins can cause a lot of latency. But if you go to the lower left hand corner, you have this thing. It's probably you know maybe not the most intuitive name called constrained delay compensation. And what that's going to do is that will basically bypass and deactivate the plugins that are causing the latency. So when I come here, these plugins have now been bypassed and all of the plugins that are causing latency are now bypassed. When I turn that off after tracking the guitar, I could have those plugins back on the mix. So try going to the lower left-hand corner of the project window and just uh, enable the delay compensation and that will probably fix it. Um, if you're something, you know, you know, if you already have recorded tracks and it kind of changed, you know, I would assume that if you go to your studio setup and select your audio interface that the buffer is set to kind of where you would expect it initially, but some often adding plugins during a mix process after you're working on a project, you know, we could think of each of those, you know, great plugins that make a huge difference is having a bit of tax and you pay for that tax in latency. Okay, and I just see kind of a further comment. So even when I turn off all plugins and external programs, lower the buffer size, nothing fixes it. So check, you know, try just this constrained delay compensation because this way you don't have to go through every single plugin and, you know, it could be plugins that are also in your control room, stuff like that. So but try that constrained delay compensation, Laser Wolf, and let us know if that helps. All right, so we have John, John Clive checking in from Wales in the UK. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the live stream. Okay, so we see from Jeff Zabelski, uh, opening Mahler template, uh, when I use the project key and choose B flat, it gives the N harmonic. Okay then, but then it doesn't change the score into that key as the flute and oboes, uh, the keys remain in C, Y. Okay. Okay, so let's say, I'll just do quick. Okay so, okay, so I'm not sure if the Mahler template, if it's something you did. So let's say I'll just do a new project here. One preference that may help you out, Jeff. Okay, so I'm gonna add a quick chord track. Drop the, we'll just put in the key. All right. All right, so let's say I just want to go to my adaptive scales. All right, so let's try. Okay, so let's say if we go here, just one little preference that's very obtusely 
it's a it's a bit hard to find. I guess obtuse is not the good words. Uh, Okay, so let's say N harmonics from chord track. All right, so now let's say if I go to we'll do just a quick oboe part here. Okay, and let's say we go to our score editor view. Then I'm just gonna double click here and go to main. So let's say we're in B flat. So, you know, these, I, you know, I, I'm just gonna reread this. Um, Okay, so it says, but then it doesn't change the score into that key as the flute and oboe's keys remain in C, Y. So I think that the, you know, setting the chord track doesn't necessarily automatically equate the key from the chord track into the score editor. So there's still kind of, I see where it makes sense that those two could be tied together, but for, you know, a lot of compositions, it could make sense for them to be, decoupled. So you may have to manually enter in the key signature for the actual parts. Um, and one thing, you know, obviously you don't need it for flute or oboe, but for other transposing instruments, you could just choose those here. But, you know, just setting the key in, you know, here, we can think of that as more for MIDI editing, uh, but it doesn't, that doesn't translate automatically to the score so th those are still kind of independent I, I see where it makes sense that they would be tied together maybe by default but i think they're still kind of even i think it's even done by the same developer um who handles that so but i'll pass that along as feedback Okay, we have a question. How can I set up the control room to play back using Very Audio? Seems like Very Audio playback won't work with control room enabled. There's another function uh, in Very Audio that a lot of people miss uh, for hearing it. So it's not just having the control room, but one button that gets kind of uh, turned off quite a bit. So if we go to Very Audio, and have it do its analysis. Uh, we'll look at this. And it's this little icon here. So now when I move notes, I don't hear it, but you wanna turn on the, make sure that the acoustic feedback is turned on. And then you can hear the changes. So just make sure that that is enabled there. So give that a try and see if that fixes the problem for you. Uh, and I see Laser Wolf. We're about uh, continuing on with the discussion of you know. There's only latency in that one particular you know about latency and recording your, the guitar. Um, so it says, and when I open a new session, there is no latency. It only exists in that session. So that you know, I I think there's probably a plugin, whether it's an insert, a send, maybe a plugin on a group that's causing that. 
So, you know, one kind of fail safe way is again, that constrained delay conversation. So try that. So even if you went through and you manually disabled 89 plugins, there could be one more that you just missed that could be kind of causing the problem. So. All right, so we have a question. I use freeze for my MIDI channels. Is it useful for audio channels? So yeah, a lot of people would use freeze for audio channels. Like if they had, you know, the perfect EQ, they had all of the effects exactly how they wanted it. And they wanted to basically burn those processing sounds directly into the file so that it wasn't taking any CPU resources. It was probably more relevant when you know, computers weren't as fast as they are now. So people would freeze to save resources. So that's why a lot of people do it. But it's also a way of, you know, being able to kind of commit to the sound. If you have to pass on the file to someone else, you know, it's kind of can be embedded within the file so no one else can mess it up for you. So freezing is still popular for uh, audio as well as VST instruments. And, you know, you could also use render in place to kind of solve a lot of the issues as well. So I think freeze is probably like an earlier conceptual, um, you know, approach than render in place. And they both will kind of get you to the same spot. Okay, so we have a question from Filter Freak. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Cubase 11.02, Windows 10 batch mixed down. One project would only mix down in real time. No external inserts or instruments in my rack. Mixed down in real time box and export was unchecked. Uh, any ideas why? So generally, you know, when it's doing that, um, so says no external instruments or, you know, no external inserts or instruments in my rack. So sometimes I've seen this when, you know, just a, you know, maybe a, a send effect is, you know, you know, maybe there's an, you know, if you have any processing whatsoever. So like on Tuesday's live stream, I was doing an export audio mix down and I just loaded up an empty instrument track of like, and it's something that was routed to an external plugin. And even though that wasn't being used in the project, that that automatically triggered. So if there's a presence of anything that could be an external uh, processor instrument or um, or effect. And if you go to your audio connections, one way to test it is, you know, if you go to your external instruments and these are all blank, go to your external effects and those are all blank, then I would, you know, but I think it's going to be one of those two things where the program has to do it in real time, uh, even if not selected. So let me know if you're if you go to your audio connections, if both your external effects and instruments are blank, uh, and see if that is the case, and let me know. I uh, see Tony Galasco says, Greg, I uh, heard you say you worked with Teddy Riley back in the day. Are you responsible for new Jack Swing? Yes, it was all me. No, Teddy's incredibly talented with that stuff. And it's always, yeah, I started working with him maybe uh, like doing stuff with him like 99, 2000, something like that. Uh, it, it, incredibly smart, driven, focused guy and you know it's interesting i remember one time we were doing a nam show presentation and it, the interesting thing was you know it was like one of the few nam show demos where stevie wonder actually sat down to listen to what teddy was saying and how teddy's approach was to things and he was just working on something that was he was putting a beat together like in front of two three hundred people at the steinberg booth and it just really didn't sound like it was coming together. And he put like seven different things and it was not sounding 
good. And then he put the eighth part in and it all just came together. So it's really interesting kind of talking to him and his approach to rhythm and his approach to groove. Uh, it's really fascinating. So I didn't do anything with New Jack Swing. Uh, you know, it's Teddy deserves all of the credit for that. You know, to have a genre based on your work is it's pretty amazing. So, uh, but always, yeah, I look forward to seeing him again sometime in Las Vegas where he lives uh, and catching up in person. So. All right, question. How do you make a four bar play throughout a two or three minute track? Copy paste. All right, so if we have just a little part here, you know, let's say I wanted to take this part and just have it follow. Um, we could just, if you just grab it by the end, you don't even have to cop, copy and paste. You could just grab, and you see this little icon in the right center, just drag that out. And that's really all you have to do. There are some other tricks that you could do. So if I wanted to create um, just like a little local loop here, let's say I just want to do like two bars of this or one measure or slightly less, then we could come and put this into... Uh, there's like a little local loop mode. Let's see if I have it activated. But there is like a little way that you could set up like a little local loop within the region, but just, you know, it's really super easy just to drag it across and it takes, you know, all of 12 seconds to do. So that's what I would do. And that way you could see it visually with all the other parts uh, within your project. All right, so we have a question. When installing a trial version, do I have to activate the trial license before or after installing add-ons? Um, it doesn't really matter if it's activated before or after, just those add-ons won't work until they're installed. So if the license is already installed, the functionality will just you know work. If you haven't installed them, Cubase will still work, um, but it will... Um, just not have access to it. So, Okay, so question, how much DC offset is okay? Um, if you have the opportunity to fix DC offset whenever you have some, uh, do it. Uh, it's one of those things that just kind of creeps up in a lot of people and some people's facilities will just kind of be riddled with it and wondering why stuff doesn't quite, you know, have that impact during your mix, you know, so as a fail safe, just do a DC offset test, uh, like, you know, before you send off your file to be, you know, to be made a CD or for distribution, you know, 10 seconds could save you a lot of embarrassment later on in your production process. All right, wonderful to see Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. I hope you're doing well. Or you see, we see that sub 403 son got control of his keyboard. Yeah, my son does that too. So usually during meetings, so likes to jump on my chair and pull my hair and stuff just for the camera. All right, so we have uh, M. Timothy Samarin uh, from Las Vegas. Am I able to audition live guitar plugins while playing unprocessed guitar on an input? The way it is now, I need to record raw electric guitar parts first. One of the things that can change the behavior of this is if you go to your studio setup, select your audio interface here and make sure that direct monitoring is turned off. When direct monitoring is enabled, and this may also be set in your oper in the control panel or mixer software of your audio interface, 
But when direct monitoring is off is basically it's going to take the signal from the input directly to the output. And at that point, you can monitor without any perceived latency. Now, how it does that is it's, you know, physically, basically just doing a physical patch from input to output. And it's not by it's not going through any of the software effects. So if you just put, you know, a guitar part on an insert, uh, like while you're recording it, let's see if we could maybe even show this on a project, see if I could manipulate it here. Um, so, but if you just have it on an insert, you know, uh, at that point, you could monitor the guitar signal once you have the monitor enable. But let's go ahead and see if we could show this. I'll just uh, let me go to sorry another project it doesn't have. Okay, so here, what I'm gonna do is take uh, this guitar. Okay, and I'll adjust the panning here. Okay, and this is actually just a dry guitar, so I'll just bypass my inserts. So I'm going to send this to a group track just so that we could kind of mimic because I don't have a guitar handy. Okay, and now what I want to do is I'm going to create an audio track and this is just kind of a fancy way of so these two channels are linked and I'm going to set this input to the group from the group channel. Um, all right, so, but uh, sorry, it's not showing up for some reason, but what you wanted to do is just, if you bypass the direct monitoring, uh, and then you know, just monitor the guitar, you'll be able to hear the effect as you play the guitar in. But if direct monitoring is turned on, then at that point, you're not able to, it's going, it's bypassing all of the software plugins, but that's all you have to do. So just turn off and disable direct monitoring. Sorry, you can get the, the demonstration there to work. Okay. Okay, so I just see from the Traveler 604, is it possible to correct the offset, the whole mix, or is it better to correct it on the bus? Um, so I'm not sure what offset you're referring to. So if you could just uh, let me know, because you know the plugins are automatically delay compensated for, so there's nothing to correct with that. Um, if you have, if you're using external processing, you could measure for the latency, measure for the delay and compensate for that. But maybe if you could let us know Traveler 604, if, which offset you're referring to.
Okay, so we have a question. Hi, when I want to change the track volume just a bit, I hold shift and drag the volume fader up and down and it will make minor movements. Is there a way to do the same for a chunk of automation points? So just to kind of show this, you can get kind of fine control by holding down the shift key. Uh, so let's take a look at some automation. All right, so let's say I'll select those points. Um, all right, so let's say, okay, so if we adjust these here, so let's say, You know, you could do it just if you go to the info line, just go to the info line here. So if we have those automation points, so I could, and I'm just using my mouse scroll wheel to adjust. Uh, but if I hold down the shift key, we get fine control of the value. So that's without the shift key. Now with, sorry, uh, with the shift key, Fine control, kind of macro control now. So give it a shot, just holding down the shift key in that field right there and adjusting using the scroll wheel of the mouse. Okay, my chat field just jumped on me a little bit. Let me just scroll back. Okay, I think we're okay. Okay, so I see Jeff Sabelski says, Greg, I used XFAT to download for the transfer to NTFS, but the download assistant wipes out the VST sound files and starts to download the download files again before they change to .VST sound files. Uh, is the download assistant the only way to registered successfully so you, obviously you register as soon as you purchased a program and if it's you know particular you know let me know the exact family that you're looking for jeff uh and i might be able to put it onto a temporary link file where you could download from if you want to email me at uh club cubase at steinberg.de Okay, we have a question. Is there a way to select just all the top notes, the melody, to change the velocity? Okay. So if we wanted to take, let me just get a part that has some MIDI in it. So yeah, we could do that with using something like the um, logical editor. Let's just revert this to our saved state. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. We hope that everyone's learned a tip or trick. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. And if you want to uh, make sure that uh, you have hit the like button. All right, so let's say if I wanted to look at this part uh, and I wanted to select everything a a that's higher than A3 in this case. So I'll go to the logical editor and I'll just choose to select um, type is equal to notes and we'll say um, value one, their pitch is going to be bigger than C3 or A, was, we said A3, so let's say A3. So now at this point, I could just say, okay, we're gonna select all the notes that are bigger than A3, but I could also say bigger or equal to A3. Now, if I wanted to do that and say, let's take all of those notes and let's kind of take value to the velocity, I could say, let's subtract 20 to the velocity of all notes higher than A3. So if we wanted to look at our, velocity info here. 
we could say, okay, now I'm just going to say every note that has a velocity higher than A3, drop the velocity by 20. So you could do stuff like that and kind of kill two birds with one stone. So not only can you select the events, but you could also select those events and choose an action in the action target of what you want to do with it, like adjusting the velocity. Okay, so I see Jeff Sabelski is with our setting the key question earlier. So it says, uh, manual says to change project key, go to project, uh, drop down menu and choose project key. So let's take a look. So I don't remember that setting, but... Maybe set up musical scales. Don't think that's it. I don't think it's in project setup or default key. So I could take a look at it. Yeah, I could take a look at it, Jeff, if you want to send me just a brain cramp email reminder. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I'm trying to solve a Cubase 9.5 Pro problem. On the left window near the inspector tab, visibility tab is there, and at the bottom it says track and zones tabs are visible but no inspector. So let's come over here. Um, so when you go to visibility, we see track and zones. You just need to click right up here in the upper left-hand side, uh, just to the left of visibility, and that will kind of switch the mode of the inspector tabs. So you can see the visibility settings, just click there on inspector, and then your inspector will come back. So let me know if that does a trick for you, Bruce. All right, so we have David M just checking in from uh, near Liverpool. So always want to go there. Okay, so we have a question. What's the best way to use a software mic pre plugin on a vocal as an insert on a line in? It doesn't record, so should it be used after the fact on a vocal track and reprocessed again? So you could do that, but if you go to your input channels, uh, you know, you have input channels here, and we see these in red. So you could say, okay, I have my audio connections. Let's say I want to record, you know, my. Uh, let's say your name is 59 Strat. So I want to record my, I'm going to add a bus. Let's say it's a mono input bus. So we're going to add one. All right. And we'll call this, you know, my SM57 to record my Strat. All right. This is the mic I'm using or whatever you wanted to define the input here. So we could go to this input channel and on the input channel, we have inserts. So if you wanted to embed an in like the plugin and kind of burn it into the file, you could actually apply the mic pre uh, plugin on the input chain. Now this may cause latency depending on what the latency of the plugin is. So that's something to be aware of. So, but kind of look, you know, you could put on the input and you know, as the file is recorded, it's going through that mic pre plugin. If you wanted it to be after the fact, um, at that point, you could just choose to run it as an insert after the file has been recorded. But you could, you could apply the file to the recording as well.
Okay, so we have another question. Uh, I think we covered this earlier, but we'll do it quickly again. How do I export an instrument track as audio? I want to open my files in another program. Okay, all you have to do is you could select the track here, go to, you know, if you wanted to, you know, there's a couple of approaches. One way is to, if you're looking to migrate to another program, probably the easiest way is just go to your export audio mix down choose multiple and you can say, okay, I want my output channels, my group channels, effects, instrument channels, and this will make stems based on the left and right locators of your whole song. And this way you could have multiple instruments done and just export it to a new folder and you can make stems if you need to take it to another program for some reason. Uh, you could also just take a selection set like the, you know, if I wanted to just render you know, this piano part. So I will select the track and you could go to render in place. And at this point we can say we want to include the effects. And since I selected the track itself, I could actually just choose to disable the source track. So I could say, okay, let's render it. It'll take this whole part of the piano and we could select multiple tracks this way as well, which is handy. And we do this and now the, you know, we could just turn the piano part directly into an audio file just that easily. So you could do batch exporting or render in place. All right, we see from LaserWolf that the uh, constrained delay compensation worked out. Uh, much appreciated. So that was with his recording the guitar with the latency in that one project. So yeah, and it could be, I was just thinking about this, we we're going answering the questions on the input channel. It could be a plugin that's maybe even on an input channel and it's something you don't think to look at because it often is kind of, you don't look at that part in your mix console. So, but thanks for letting us know LaserWolf that did the trick. All right, so you see uh, using Pro 11 on Windows 10 Pro machines, sometimes when launching Cubase, it hangs on checking VST3. If I halt the process and go back in, it loads properly. Any suggestions? So sometimes it's a plugin that's maybe, you know, um, you could see if it's if there's a plugin that's listed, and sometimes it's not the plugin that's listed, but it's unable to maybe load the next plugin. Like it's trying, and sometimes it'll do like like an integrity analysis check. So, you know, if it's, you could, one other thing that it could be is just making sure that you have the latest e-licenser installed, you know, the license management software, which you could get from elicenser.net. Um, but if it's loading up fine, you're probably okay. It's maybe just a plugin that's not... Uh, you know, cooperating or, or maybe if it was one that was block listed, that was that you, you know, wanted to enable manually, stuff like that could cause that. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hi, all from Italy. Do I use more CPU power with a native reverb plugin, send aux, or with a hardware unit as an external effect? So the hardware unit isn't going to take any CPU resources. Uh, you know, probably just, you know, infinitesimal, very, very, very small just to get audio in and out of your system. So it's not going to utilize your CPU for that. Unless you have a really old computer, you know, there's a number of different reverb plugins that you could run as a send that don't take a lot of, uh, that don't take a lot of CPU power. So, so check, you know, you, so unless you have a really old system, I probably wouldn't worry about it. Uh, and I would use maybe an external reverb if, you know, I had a Bricasti or a Lexicon 480L and I spent a bunch of money and it's like, and, and sure enough, I'm going to use that because, you know, I have to justify my, uh, financial investment in it. So I'm going to use it on every project, you know, whether it needs it or not. So, all right. So we have studio da music or DS music checking in from Brazil. Thanks for joining us on the live stream.
All right. So the kind of the a, a very common question. Hello, how do I make my track sound louder? Uh, I'm new to Cubase. I've gotten all the basics. I just want to know how to make the louder without cranking the faders up. There's a lot of things, you know, that can make tracks sound softer. You know, it, you know, so a lot of people, you know, go through a lot of different processes and sometimes can create more issues for their mix than they anticipate. Um, a lot of people put a compressor on everything uh, and that could limit the dynamic range. Arrangements uh, can make a huge difference. Why so many recordings sound wonderful is because the musicians have done their own arrangements and they put in a lot of thought and detail where the piano isn't in the same neighborhood and clashing with the bass. You know, the, you know, other, you know, the guitarist and keyboard players are, you know, voicing their chords differently. And so when you have clashes like that, that can often, you know, cause a lot of problems where the mix isn't sounding right and it's muddy and it's unclear and it's not, doesn't have that impact. So, you know, there's always, you know, ways of just taking, you know, the actual files and in increasing the gain. You know, once you have your mix down file, I know some people that don't worry about killing their mix down file and they'll just normalize at the last stage. Uh, and they kind of can retain a lot of their dynamics. So there, there's, a, you know, it's a very complex question. And some people will say, you know, oh, how do you, you know, get your mix loud and punchy? And then, you know, an answer I've heard from some people is like, you know, you make 20 years of bad mistakes and you slowly figure it out through a process. Uh, use, you know, reference material. But, you know, don't, you know, make sure that the gain structure internally is working so those are some things that you could do to make it louder without pushing up the faders and there's nothing wrong with pushing up faders either a lot of people can sometimes shy away from it because they feel like pushing up the fader can mess up the gain structure and it's kind of going back to maybe an analog console mindset where you know if, if you pushed up a lot of faders you heard a lot of noise and you had to deal with that that's not really the case with what you have in a daw so Okay, uh, so we just see, okay. Okay, so uh, so we have a question. Uh, can you ask your friend Vince to release Beatles or Stones? It's great and such a shame that nobody, me in particular, has heard it all the way through. I'm sure he, I'm sure it'd be a hit. So I will, I'll make sure to give him a call tomorrow just to express his sentiments. I'm sure he would be thrilled. And maybe we could see, uh, I mean, he is a Cubase user. Uh, and I will reach out and see if he can make maybe a guest appearance at the next uh, end of month live stream so you guys can meet him. He has just wonderful stories, just a great guy. Um, and I need to give Vince a call anyway. I haven't talked to him in, in a few months. So, all right, we see Michael Pierce is back from his trigonometry project. I think he's just trying to sound smarter than us, so which he probably is. Okay, we have a question from Jay from Connecticut. Uh, I was in a corner uh, reconfiguring computer hardware and heard you answer a question about DC offset. Would you be uh, so kind as to share what it is and problems it can cause? So DC offset is often kind of kind of caused by you know it could be electrical problems in your studio. So sometimes you may uh, look at a waveform. And as we look at a waveform, we can see that this is pretty symmetrical. In a DC offset, it may be just kind of tilted. So you you may look at, you know, it may, let's see if I could, I don't think I have any files that uh, could, could indicate it. Um, but when you look at the waveform, you'll notice that it's almost like this, but kind of tilted like, you know, 10 degrees. 
and you'll notice that the waveform isn't very symmetrical. Now it would be an indication that, you know, that there is a problem with DC offset. So one of my mastering engineer friends I've spoken of, you know, the amazing Greg Lukens, who lives just a couple miles from me, probably has the best ears of anyone in the world. Uh, just freakishly good ears. Uh, and that's like something he's like, I can't believe, you know, and he gets records from people and he'll call the mastering and mixing engineers like, you know, you have a huge DC offset problem and, you know, he calls them up and they go, oh, I can't believe I didn't check. And you know, like this one 10 second thing just made the whole mix come together. So at that point, you know, just as a rule of thumb, before you send out your final track, just run it through DC offset. It just takes so little time and could solve a problem so easily. And Jazz Dude's giving a much better description of it. All right, my find my chat field. Okay, reading through different comments. All right, we see a comment from Fred Robinson. Uh, oh my God, after years and years of using QAs, I didn't know about that fine adjustment of faders. Let's see. All right, so now you know. So you have to share one great Cubase trick with everyone else. Keep the karma going. All right, wonderful to see Neurotic Nexus who just came around to smash the like button. Said, <laughs> this is a great comment. Notice that five people have really bad aiming. So I don't know, maybe I irritated someone. Who knows? Hopefully not. Okay, uh, so we just see a question, how can I change project tempo after recording without changing the events themselves? All right, so we'll show you, you know, so once the audio events are kind of placed uh, in musical mode, let me just revert this, uh, basically indicating that it the program knows what tempo the original track was. And you could do this several different ways, but let's come over here. Um, so I know that when I record audio in the Cubase, it's going to be tempo stamped. So if I wanted to select all of my files and place it into musical mode right here. So once all of my files are selected, I can hit play. And now whatever tempo I type in, it'll just play back at that tempo. So 144. 96, 80, and if you wanted to just change the tempo and do an accelerando or a retard to slow down, you could just type in the tempo or have it follow a tempo map. So basically the audio itself is almost like a tempo parasite.
All right, so you just see a question, does Telarc still exist? Uh, I had Telarc vinyls in the, in the late 70s, Best Stravinsky. So I believe they're still in business. I know one of their engineers went on to do five-thirds music or five-fourths music, something like Michael Bishop, and he just recently passed away, which is really sad. And uh, he was a Nuendo user. Uh, but, yeah, just stunning classical recordings. I remember getting to talk with uh, – kind of famed conductor when I was in college I got to perform with Robert Shaw uh you know who's conductor of Atlanta Symphony and you know met, you know won like 30 some Grammys or something ridiculous and you know he would just tell me all these like great little telarc recording tricks they would do like putting plywood on all of the seats uh in the concert hall and you know just to get more re you know reverberant you know environment so Okay, reading through different comments. So thanks for all the wonderful questions and discussions. Yeah, and as Jazz Dude was mentioning, like Telarc uh, used audio file hardware equipment in the late 70s, and you know, they're always you know, considered the best sounding classical uh, label and the recordings they did are just stellar. reading through more comments here thanks for all the great discussions okay so we have a question uh when i click the plus sign to the right in the filter window under logical and media bay nothing happened it should give me another row uh cubase pro 1102 so let's take a look. All right, so sometimes it may give you another row, but you may have to slide over to see the rows. So let me just reread the question. Uh, and nothing happened, it should give me another row. So let's say if I click on plus, Here, um, all right, so it looks like if we go over here to settings, let's say if I go to musical and I want to see bar count, and now as I click here, we can see the bar count. So it could be that uh, you may need to click on this like the little settings cogwheel so let's say if i come here to we go to the end i see bar count and then if i click here below the plus that at that point you could just add more fields and scroll over Okay, so we have a question. Hi, Greg. I'm using a mid-2015 MacBook Pro Intel 7, Intel i7, 16 gigs of RAM works well. Uh, needs more RAM. Wondering if upgrading my late 2012 iMac i5, 16 gigabyte of RAM to 32 gigabyte of RAM would be better than my 2015 uh, MacBook Pro. So it's probably, I, I think that probably your i5 would be a slower processor and it's 
three years older than your your uh, MacBook Pro. So if you were doing a lot of orchestral library work, you know that's where the extra RAM could really benefit from sample playback instruments, like large sample libraries. If it's just doing audio stuff, I don't think you would notice much of an improvement. So at that time, you know, I'm trying to remember, you know, what the what the processor was, but I'm sure that a the processor on a 2015 i7 was going to be better than the i5 2012. So, it, but if you're kind of really, you know, doing large orchestral sample based stuff, you could probably benefit from the 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, but if it's kind of typical stuff and you can say, okay, I could freeze this or render this in place, you know, I don't think it may make that huge of a difference. It's a great quote from Jazz Dude. There are, there are serious audiophile record labels, but also a lot of voodoo snake oil sellers. Uh, I'm a veteran in that field. So yeah. It's, I, I, I find some of the high-end audiophile people just kind of, some of their discussions would be kind of amusing. So. Okay, so questions. Uh, I want the MIDI events not to follow my project tempo. Sometimes I play in something without metronome and then I'd like to change the tempo after the fact. But the MIDI event follows the tempo. So if you don't want the MIDI event to follow the tempo, I'll just do... So let's say I just play something in... So I would just kind of, let's say I just record. Right, so I'm at a tempo of 100 beats a minute. Uh, and then if I change the tempo here to 144, it'll play back faster. All right, so if I don't want it to follow the tempo, all I would have to do is to place this track where you see this little quarter note here, musical quarter note, switch that to time-based linear where you see a clock. So now I'll change the tempo to 144. Uh, the position of that event will change, but it's playing back at the same exact position. So now. So if you want the MIDI to stay exactly at the actual position where you recorded it just make sure midi tracks by default will go into musical mode but switch it to linear mode and at that point uh, it'll stay exactly where it was all right so we see uh jeff sabelski says robert shaw i have many of his records yeah, he was a truly wonderful old man and yeah i just went up and talked to him told him i was interested in recording when i was kind of uh, principal bassist for one of the groups he was guest conducting. And, you know, we had just a, you know, he invited me out for dinner and just really lovely conversations. And I just have nothing but, you know, admiration for him. And he wasn't even a trained musician, interestingly enough. Uh, so we see Greg, do you know of Cubase being used in any major studios? So yeah, I know lots of major studios are using it. Um, you know, if, I'm not sure exactly where you are location wise, Clay. Uh, but you know, I know guys in Miami, they're doing, you know, lots of work in Nashville, lots of LA work, New York, you know, all over the place, you know, so. Yeah, I just see from Graham, it says, you know, Hans Zimmer uses Cubase. Look what he's achieved. He's done okay for himself, you know. And, you know, if you look at Junkie XL and PNR Toprock and, 
look at Alan Silvestri and Ludwig Gorenson, you know, all those guys are Cubase as well. So question, why is digital recording so much different than analog? You know, they're, they're in some ways they're very similar, you know, use similar approaches to get like a high quality recording. Um, but you know, the digital doesn't change. I think it's also the, the point of entry with digital recording now is so much less expensive and so much more accessible that, you know, someone who has really wonderful experience can, you know, have an inexpensive piece of equipment and get a wonderful recording. Uh, so it, the barrier to entry isn't as extreme, you know, but with analog recording and I was the guy who used to have to do all the tape machine maintenance when I worked at the recording studio. So I was the one, you know, every two hours that would have to, you know, re realign the tape machines. And, you know, I find that a lot of people that, you know, long for the old days of analog tended not to work in it, you know, in a very granular way. So, and, you know, I always remember thinking in sessions, you know, it's like as people recorded, it sounded great, you know, while they're tracking and it sounded different, you know, when it played back off of tape. So, you know, I think if you use kind of tried and true analog principles with digital that, you know, you'll find that they're pretty similar in a lot of ways. Um, all right, so to see, all right. Okay, sorry, my chat field just jumped on me. Okay, uh, I see from Ray Mitchell a question. Hey Greg, which mouse are you using with your Q Mac Cubase? So I've always kind of been a fan of Logitech mice. Um, I have some, let me see if I could uh, find an, a name for my current one. So I, I like the Microsoft mice as well. I'm currently using a, let's see, I'm just, I have bad light, a VSS Plur, or let me just, it's written, yeah, VSSO Plur. And why I have this mouse is I have multiple computers. Uh, so I have like my work MacBook Pro, I have a Microsoft Surface Go that I use to kind of read the chat and for kind of, you know, general computing and I have my studio computer. So I have three computers and this mice, I have a keyboard that I could switch between three different computers and my mice can switch between three different computers. And so I have an iClever, um, it's a US a wireless USB and Bluetooth keyboard. So I could, so I have it set up so I don't have to have three different mice and three different com, uh, computer keyboards, but I could just kind of hit a button and it switches. Uh, but the one thing I do, you know, and the one thing I do appreciate about this, uh, and I got it on Amazon for 30 bucks or something, is that the mouse click button is very quiet. Um, like when I do tutorial videos, it's the last thing, you, you know, it's like nails on a chalkboard hearing your mouse click button. So... But, uh, but generally, you know, like I tended to, you know, I had like a bunch of Logitech mice that all have like missing, you know, transceivers, like little transmitter things, the USB parts. So I've just kind of migrated to a lot of Microsoft mice. Uh, I found that they work well Bluetooth, so I don't have to worry about losing uh, the little USB uh, transceiver part. So nothing really special, so. All right, so we have uh, Brian Sawyer checking in from North Carolina. Thanks for joining us.
Okay, so we see from Peter, would you pass on being able to horizontally scroll in the mix console window to the developers? If you just kind of go to the bottom here, you could just, you know, let me just uh, add a bunch of tracks here. So, you know, if you just kind of hover towards the bottom and just use your mouse scroll wheel, you could scroll within the mix console. So let me know if that's not doing what you want to do. But so you just kind of hover, you know, right here at the bottom where you see the white line, you could just scroll in the mix console that way. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, how can I find your beginner videos? I mean, from the start type, please. So I know that, like probably one of my most popular videos is like how to do your first audio recording. So uh, check out like the Cubase Q&A series. But there's, you know, if you go to, just go to the Cubase YouTube channel and obviously the Cubase Nation Discord, there's, you know, so many resources there. Okay, so we just see, please make a beat for me. I will pay you. So, all right, you can send me an email to clubcubase at steinberg.de, but I'm incredibly suburban. So, all right, we see Jeff Sabelski's praising his Kensington expert trackball. So, I used to go back and forth between mice and trackballs uh, just whenever I would, you know, be at one for eight hours a day and I would just switch just to, you know, for not have uh, any uh, muscle issues and repetitive stress stuff. I was the one bass player in my college studio that didn't have surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome, so I'm trying to keep it that way. We see Michael Pierce is also recommending a Logitech MX Master 2 or, or 3 mice. All right, so question, is it possible to monitor a guitar during playback on the same track when I press play, the monitoring is disabled and I have to create a separate guitar track? Um, so yeah, try to, you know, there's different monitoring preferences. Um, so let's say if I have this track set up and I have it set to monitor, and now as I hit play, so, you know, if you just enable monitor here when you hit play, but check out the preference. So if you get a, your preferences and under, uh, under VST, you know, instead of setting it to manual, you know, you could try, I have mine set to tape machine style, but there are different monitoring options available there. So give that a try. Uh, so we have a question. Do you know what software Junkie XL is running on his tablet to control Cubase? I'm sure he probably has a video on it. And, you know, Tom is so incredibly generous with sharing information. 
Uh, I know that the whole kind of genesis of that was actually um, derived, like Hans was the first one to do it with his setup. And it was created by Mark Wary. And Mark is a guy who works for Hans. And you may read like some of his reviews and sound on sound over the years. Probably like one of the smartest guys in our industry. And I think he originally developed like the the touch control for uh, and I think it's it might be a custom thing, uh, but he originally developed the touch control using I think a cash register software that would just kind of fire off key commands. And you know, Hans likes it because you know this button that's here always does this function, um, and it's all muscle memory. Uh, but next time I talk to Tom, I could see I'll I'll ask him, and uh, you know, I'll wait for him to you know next time we speak, and I'll ask him what he uses. But there's probably a good chance that he uh, has something. I, a lot of guys use Touch OC or Sherlock uh, or other popular options i've seen a lot of guys kind of migrating to sherlock as well All right, so we see people sharing their favorite mice that they're using. So, all right, so we see a question: uh, What version should a beginner like me buy, please? You know, if you're just kind of starting off, a great entry level to get started with, and realize that you know, as you invest more money, you're going to get more capabilities. And if that's intimidating, because you know, Cubase can do so much, you know. Think of getting something like, you know, Cubase Elements. You could always, you know, take your Cubase Elements, get started with it, get comfortable with it, and update or upgrade from there to Cubase Artist. And when you're kind of have, you're comfortable with that and you need to do a little more, upgrade to Cubase Pro. So you don't lose any money. So once you kind of invest in the platform, you know, like when you go up, it's not like, oh, your investment in artist is kind of, gone your investment in artist just kind of rolls into your investment into the steinberg platform so at that point you could you know like you're not buying artists you could upgrade for basically the you know what your if you know the investment you put into cubase elements you know and the price difference between the two so Okay, so we see, uh, going back to the monitoring question, no matter which monitoring mode I use, I still disables when I press space, which stops playback. When I then press play again, I have to manually click on the monitoring icon. So when I have the monitoring set here, um, so when I hit, so I'm playing, it's turned on. Now when I stop, I could just see that it is, my monitoring is still engaged, so. All right, and I just see uh, Peter, you know, kind of a further, some additional information. The thing is I would like to jam along using monitoring to record a track without having to duplicate the guitar track. So, I mean, that seems to stick for me, but, you know, see if I'm doing something differently than you. All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions. I know we had people that had submitted questions, so let's go ahead and take a look at those. All right. OK, 
Okay, so here's one I missed that was sent in. I should have probably answered on Tuesday. Uh, so it says, hi, Greg. Uh, I select um, two neighboring MIDI events from a track in project window and double click to open in lower editor. Uh, I press control A to select all the notes, but I can only scale edit velocity values in one of the parts. Is there a way to affect both events? So let's say I have both of these events selected and then I go, you know, just make sure, so you double click to open. All right, so we see that we have both of these now in our uh, edit screen and this one is active, this one is inactive. So and I think by default, if I did a select all, that it would only go to the active part. So if I wanted to scale the velocity, it's only gonna scale up for this part, but I wanted to do it for both parts. That's when I think if we turn um, this, we'll see just to the, to the left here, this edit active part only, if we turn that off, now I could double click and I could adjust the values, um, so let's see, I thought that we could do it this way. So, so let's say I will now select all of the events and let me just adjust, let me just come here and put the info line on. So I'm gonna adjust the velocity here. So now we can see that both events, when we change it from the info line, will be the same. So I'll select all, and now when I adjust from the velocity, that both events will be edited together. Okay, um, all right, so we had a question uh, sent in from Jason. Uh, it says, firstly, I wanna thank you to, uh, to touch base. Firstly, thank you for all the live streams you do. They're amazing, uh, knowledge in Cubase. Uh, says they're amazing and your knowledge of Cubase is second to none. We are all learning so much. So I'm sure as people know Cubase much better than I do. Uh, but thank you for the kind words. Um, so we had a couple of questions on Cubase 10. How do I change the tempo of vocal acapella so that it's in time with the project? Uh, it is Marvin Gaye singing what's going on and I want to speed it up for a remix. I will then add other instrumentation. His timing is a little off, uh, but I want to get the whole vocal to 120 BPM. I don't mind tweaking the odd word here or there to get it to be fairly accurate and um, any help would be greatly appreciated. So let's see if I could find something that I won't get kind of dinged on YouTube. So I may not be able to play it, but um, I'll take kind of a live recording with, uh, but I think this should just find something with varying tempo. Yeah, and this isn't the actual track, but it's. Okay, so let's say if I want to, um, Okay. All right, so if you have a, like an acapella vocal, you know, depending on the vocal part, um, you know, what you may have to do is, so let's say you set this to bars and beats, uh, and then we just remove other tracks here. Just get them out of the way. Okay, so, you know, if you wanted to, you know, just kind of come here, you could find the, I'll put this just kind of at the top. 
And, you know, as you listen to the phrases, you know, what you could do is say, you know, this is where the downbeat should be. Grab this tool, the time warp tool. And you can say, this is where measure nine is. Measure 10 should be right here. And you could do it by beat or by measure. Say measure 11 is here. And as we make these little changes, it's basically just gonna you know, write in the tempo values. So we can say, okay, measure 14 is here. Measure 16 is here. If you need it to, so this will, once we kind of figure out what that tempo map is, if we want it to write these varying tempo changes into like the timestamp, the tempo stamp of the file itself, we could do that by coming up here and going to your audio menu to advanced and just set this to set definition from tempo. And what this will do is it will automatically, you know, say at this point in the audio file, the tempo is 92 beats a minute. The next measure, it's 94 beats a minute. The next measure, it's 91 beats a minute or however much that you kind of find the tempo information. Then when you, so that's going to embed all the tempo track data into the file. So I'll come here just to show you that. Let's get audio to advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. And we could save that into the project or write the definition into the audio file itself. Now, when we would play that back, we could import that into any project and place it into musical mode. And it would automatically conform to whatever tempo you have in your project. Uh, so at that point, you know, and if you need it to do, you know, editing of like, you know, one little thing, and I would wait to do the editing until it's imported into the project. Uh, at that point, I would probably just do, you know, if you go to audio warp and you could enable free warp and say, okay, you know, I want this part here. And, you know, this part was a little early or a little late. And you could just adjust, you know, the different starting positions, like, accordingly to make it match and tweak it if necessary. So that's really kind of all you'd have to do. So give that a shot and let us know how it works out. Okay, so we had a question. How do I authorize guitar harmonics? Uh, and he sent a picture. I've downloaded a free instrument and it shows in my Steinberg library manager, but every time I load her up, the splash screen comes up with that warning. Again, uh, any help would be hugely appreciated. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your time and consideration. So I think um, if memory serves right, you could download the guitar harmonics, you install it, but you might also have to install um, an e-license code. So, you know, look in your My Steinberg account or you may have an email address where, you know, if you just downloaded it, you may have to go to Guitar Harmonics uh, and choose to, you know, register it to your My Steinberg account. And then you'll, pro I think you get a e-licensor code. So if you just kind of downloaded it and installed it, you may need to just get the e-license code and put that into your e-licensor software. And I think that will take care of it for you, Jason. Okay, so we had some uh, further questions and I figured out one solution for the um, VST Connect that we we're discussing last week. So let's take a quick look for Sven. Okay, so let's say if we're doing kind of a VST connect, let me just set up my other computer here. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm kind of logged into my VST Connect. So, and Sven was nice enough to send uh, different screenshots. Um, so let's go ahead and read. So, okay, so question one I inserted an instance of Steinberg Test Generator set to 1K test tone on the master stereo bus. I then set up a minus 
6 dB FS gain stage all the way to the to the Q VST connect output since I use mix uh, as a source for the Q output the Q settings on the channels are inconsequential uh, as you could clearly see the levels are correct all the way however when it comes to VST connect pro the level has dropped dramatically since the studio fader is that unity gain the level should reflect that the Q output in Cubase it clearly isn't something is happening in a gain staging between Cubase and VST Connect Pro um, and as the red arrow so so let's go ahead and take a look so what I did is I kind of set this up and then I'll make sure I don't kill everyone volume wise as we do this so I have a 1k test tone um okay so i have my my vst connect performer computer uh connected into my mixer as well so i could listen to the vst connect studio and i could also listen to the vst connect performer computer just by hitting uh my on and off switch here so when i look at this uh, so I can see my control room output and let's see if I can mimic um, the settings that he, he he had utilized here. Okay, so I'll just turn that down. So let's say if I have my VST connect and now I want it to send it out to the to the musician into their headphone mix to make sure that their gain is set. So I, I'm going to come to this channel and go to my QSense and turn on QSend two. So as soon as we, as soon as I see my QSend two now, okay. So as I do this, we can. And notice that as I adjust my Q, my monitoring volume here, that it's not affecting kind of what's going out to the musician. Now I'll, I'll verify that in just a second. So I set the, you know, the Q mix for the particular channel, and I'm going to switch now over to what the performer is hearing, and we can see it's, you know, it's the same. And I you know, set the volume levels on the two interfaces. The volume on the mix console is identical in the two channels. So this is the studio, and this is what the musician is hearing. Now, if I adjust my cue send here, that doesn't affect what the musician is hearing. But if I adjust my cue send here, that affects the gain structure of what's going on to the musician directly there. So if I, I'll just come here and send that back to zero dB. So the, this gain structure doesn't seem to have an impact. So this is the what the performer is hearing on their computer. This is what is being transmitted from the audio computer when we monitor. So as you can see there, you know, basically the same volume and you know so i don't think that the control room is you know has an effect on what's being transmitted to the musician but this q mix here does so i'm going to go back to the musician's computer and now i switch and we adjust this back to zero db and so it sounds like the same level to me so Sven, if you could let me know if you've actually, you know, if you've had a musician complain that the level isn't good or is too soft, um, let me know. But it seems, you know, when I'm testing it here, it doesn't seem to be an issue. And this, you know, so maybe it's not the control room that's doing it, but, you know, this mix level here on the source is really critical to what the musician is, it is hearing. So I know last week, you know, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> you know, I was, you know, you were saying I misunderstood, but it, that seems pretty similar when I switch between what the performer is hearing 
and what the studio is hearing. And if I put both of them together, So I haven't done anything. So, you know, using two different audio interfaces, you know, both Steinberg interfaces with the volume set the same way, you know, it doesn't seem like it's a gain structure volume for the musician to hear. So I'm not sure if you're using the, you know, this for the QMix or if you're just monitoring off of, you know, QMix 2 here and sending that, so let's see if that makes a difference. So, you know, this QMix volume, your master volume in your control room doesn't seem to have an effect, whereas this is the critical one. So let me know, I'm sure I'm, I'm probably misunderstanding, and if I am, you know, just please let me know. But that's how it seems to me when I have it set up. All right, and we had another question and I found kind of the little hidden preference for this. Um, okay, so it says, uh, with regard to the talkback switch, on page 20 in the user guide, it stated, talkback enable button. This switch, uh, this switch is talkback on or off and is linked to the talkback button on the main section of the Cubase Nuendo control room mixer. Note that this button is automatically disabled as soon as playback or recording is started in Cubase slash Nuendo. Um, and he showed pictures where he says it clearly isn't. So the problem is that uh, when we hit play, that the talk back uh, will just kind of stay kind of stuck in its place. So we go to our VST connections, I could turn on and off talk back and but the preference so i did some searching for you sven if we go to preferences uh and go to control room you can see auto disable talkback mode sorry that i missed this on tuesday uh set this to in play and record so if we say no auto disable which i think is the default setting now when i go to hit Let's say I have the talk back on and I hit record. Let's say I hit play, the talk back is still engaged. I hit record, the talk back is still engaged. I stop, the talk back is still engaged. So that's kind of, you know, not ideally want it where you'd have to manually disable, enable the talk back. So if we go over here, we could say, let's go to our preferences again. And under control room, you can say auto disable talkback mode in play and record. So I'm going to hit apply. So now the talkback is on. I'm going to hit play. We see that the talkback is disabled. I hit record. We can see that the talkback is disabled. I hit stop. The talkback is enabled so that we could communicate with the musician. So if I just come here, hit record. Talkback is disabled when I hit stop. Now talkback is enabled. So again, go over here to preferences and you know make sure that you have this set to in play and record. And the third question that uh, Sven had comment. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to record guitar and vocals with VST Connect without printing the effects. Uh, however, the reason why inserts and sends on a performer record track doesn't work is obvious. The VST Connect monitor plugin that controls the monitoring of incoming VST Connect audio is located as an insert in a control room far later in the signal chain. It, it the, if thus bypasses the performer record track during recording. This is a major flaw in design of the VST Connect concept during the almost 50 years I've been Dealing with audio recording in one capacity or another, I've never recorded a vocal without monitoring with reverb for one thing. Uh, Steinberg, uh, really need to look into this, how to monitor the audio on the engineer side should really be a priority. So when we have an engage the reverb here, you know, we could think of this as a courtesy reverb for the performer. So, you know, if you're not familiar with this, as you're recording, you can engage different effect plugins, a compressor, EQ, 
or reverb. And the intention is if someone needs to be inspired by a quick reverb, uh, it, you know, to perform with that they could do this. Now, I think Sven's point is that this reverb isn't sent over uh, to the engineer side and that you're not able to add effects here. So, you know, I think, you know, being the fact that you could be, you can record people from around the world in your studio, you know, that, you know, it's pretty technology, uh, it's pretty amazing technology that, you know, having a reverb that's very simple, that, you know, you could control remotely with four parameters that you're probably, you know, if someone says, oh, it's too much reverb, that you could tweak these four parameters without hearing it as an audio engineer. Um, I realize that's a bummer and it's going to record the, you know, signal directly in without the reverb. But, you know, the engineer can't monitor the reverb or add other plugins. So I think that the benefit of you know having a you know having a, the benefit of being able to record remotely from any source kind of far outweighs the benefit of monitoring for the engineer um, you know with effects and i think being able to monitor you know for the musician to hear the reverb to give an inspired performance is probably more crucial that you could, you know, say, oh, it's too much. And then you could probably tweak these settings pretty easily for these plugins. And, you know, this is all to make sure that the recording integrity, that the timing is all, you know, makes sense and works without you having to do a lot of, you know, tweaking after the fact. Okay, so a question. Uh, following the latest Cubase and Groove Agent updates, I too is missing presets as mentioned in the last Hangout, Windows 10, Cubase 11. Uh, I narrowed down the missing presets to be the Groove Agent 1 bank uh, and set out to check out the Groove Agent 1 was selected in the media bay as you mentioned in the last Hangout. It is selected. However, Groove Agent 5 program browser, all the kits have a red stop sign next to their names and refuse to load. So let's take a look at that. And again, thank you for all the wonderful questions. I hope everyone's learned a tip or trick today. All right, so let's say here's my Groove Agent 1 kits here. So let's say I go to Maple Kit. And let me just... So those all seem to kind of load naturally for me, um, you know, and I didn't do anything special on this machine. I don't think I, I think it's just part of the Groove Agent content. Um, but let me just monitor the right computer now. Sorry, I have my, so that as we, just kind of do this that, you know, so those all kind of seem to load up. Um, so, you know, so let's take a look if I go to my media bay and maybe disable my Groove Agent 1 kits. Okay, so now when I go to load up a kit, I see my Groove Agent 1. So, um, so I'm not sure if you've tried to rescan. Okay, so check to make sure that, you know, you've actually, you know, one of the things that you could do is just kind of select the arrow and try just re right clicking and choosing rescan disk. 
and see if it finds the kits and if you see like the different uh, audio files indicated here. So you could see kind of, you know, the different kits when you select um, your audio files, but try just to right click and rescan disk and see if that helps you out. Okay, so those are the questions that were mailed in. Thanks for mailing the questions into Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. All right, let me just scroll back. Find my spot where I was. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a quick way to align my multiple high quality audio files? Uh, example, recorded on the Zoom F6 to an edited movie, low quality audio capture by the camera. Uh, didn't have time code to sync, unfortunately. So a lot of times now that you know everything is kind of digital, I imagine that you could probably you know, import, let's say if we import a video file All right, and let's say our video is starting, you know, right here, that you could, let's say I put the cursor here, and if I wanted to put, you know, a series of audio files, um, so let's say I just want to put this file in that I, you know, you could probably just come here, and if it was all kind of, once you kind of get the first initial uh sync point you could probably just come here and you know move to you know you can move to cursor now one thing that you could do to kind of you know synchronize the two points uh if you're not aware of this if you go to the uh double click and you could so we'll see our audio file and you'll see this little S and this is a sync point. So a lot of times you may be able to, you know, as soon as someone, you know, you have a, a like something like a, you know, why they use the little, you know, the little thing that, you know, does the, you know, sound to sync up, you know, you could enable, you know, these little things where you could say, um, you see this sync point. And once you have this sync point enabled and you could click on this, at that point, you could move, have this audio file kind of snap to that sync point. So once you have this sync point from your six recorded files to like, you know, maybe the beginning of this, then all those files can be lined up based not at the beginning of the file, but at a common uh, sync point between them. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you could probably do in just a matter of a minute or two pretty easily. All right, so I just see from uh, Peter says monitoring does not stay on. This is our discussion earlier. Uh, when I press uh, if recording is also enabled, uh, all I would like to do is both hear my playback and play over it to sketch out harmony parts. So if you're sketching out the harmony parts, you know, I'm not sure if you need to record that, but let's go ahead and give it a shot. So we'll see if my monitor um, goes off. So I'm gonna turn on my monitor and let's say I'm recording right and now when I stop, you know, so my monitor is staying on. 
as we do that, so as you watch here, so say go out of record, go in record, stop. So my monitoring is, is staying on. Okay, question from John Costigan. Should I use Media Bay to drag and drop drum samples onto a MIDI track in order to set up a bunch of each drum to mix them, snare, bass drum, etc.? So, you know, the MIDI tracks don't necessarily take, you know, a sample. You know, if you wanted to do like, you know, quick drum hits, I would maybe, you know, and if you wanted to play them, you know, via MIDI, I would just do it in Groove Agents to perfect you know, solution for this. So you could now just come over here and say, you know, I just want to go to Groove Agent and I'm looking for kick and I'm looking for floor tom or whatever and just drag all the samples. And now you could just play all of those directly from Groove Agent. So that's what I would do. So, you know, so, you know, dragging the audio isn't going to work on a MIDI track, but if you want to do drum samples, um, just do it directly onto Groove Agent. Okay, so we see uh, from Michael, hi Greg, is there a way to have an audio and MIDI track show up in the lower window at the same time, like an overlay? So currently you could have the sample editor or MIDI editor, but not kind of the two editors uh, on top. But if you really need it to do that, you know, one of the things that you could do is, let's say if I have uh, a MIDI track here, you know, you could do it easily enough on the main project window. So let's say if I'm, let me just extend this out. All right, so let's say I have all of my MIDI notes here. So, you know, there is, you know, you could say, okay, I wanted to look at my MIDI uh, with the audio. So, you know, you could just do this. And there is like, you know, if you hit Control Shift I or Command Shift I, you could do an edit in place where you could see kind of the sample edit and the MIDI editor kind of on the main project window itself. So this way you could say, okay, I want my mix console here. And, and as I'm editing, I could, you know, see the MIDI and audio just kind of like that. So it may not be as necessary in the lower zone. So give that a try. And again, you could just come here and I think it's command or control plus shift I, and that will open up the in place editor. And you could see kind of both together on the main project window. All right, well, it's wonderful to see Ambient Dave back. <clears throat> We've missed you, so great to see you, Ambient Dave. Thanks for saying hi. We hope you're doing well. <clears throat> see how we're doing on time. All right, so we're just about out of time, so I wanna thank everyone for a wonderful live stream. Um, I just want to... Okay, so, and we just had a quick question from Daryl, like what time are the live stream? So we usually do them 1 to 5 p.m. U.S. Eastern time on Tuesday and Fridays. And again, if you subscribe to the channel, you should get notified. I wanna thank everyone for the wonderful questions and I uh, hope everyone is stay safe and healthy this weekend and we'll see everyone on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Goodbye.